my name is Richard Miller, and you're at Never Not Here, so please feel welcome. We talk a lot about what is life made of, or what makes life easy, or even easier to understand sometimes is, is what makes life difficult, because we all can relate to that. And so in that sense, we're a philosophical discussion uh, show or uh, dialogue. And uh, we also want to see what's practical. So how does this philosophy really touch life? How does this philosophy really become something that operates in our families, our communities? and our, actually our nation, our world. And so I've been going down and checking out these Occupy. It started out with Occupy Wall Street and Occupy Chicago. And we have a lot of, I'll just say injustices, but there's a lot of places in society where certain people are left out. And we always thought that was a certain class that maybe somehow they weren't striving hard enough or they weren't really putting themselves wholeheartedly behind the system. And so in a way we faulted them for that. And now we're finding that uh, with factory closings and with uh, company downsizings and with uh, home foreclosures and uh, with uh, sometimes uh, difficult job perspectives, uh, even people we know, whoever we is, but you know, even people that you know, let me say, are having also difficulty and maybe something is systemic, maybe something is not ideal about about our beloved country and our beloved society. So we want to find out a lot more about what makes society work. And I don't believe that we really understand it very well. And uh, so I made an acquaintance, uh, Mr. Rob Burns, and uh, Rob's here. Uh, Hi, Richard. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. And uh, Rob has actually been studying uh, ec uh, economics for, for several decades and now working on his PhD, just a PhD in his final stages. And uh, so some kind of understanding I'm, I'm sure that you can give us. Uh, I and, hope to. I, I'm uh, trying to uh, put this in uh, language that everyone can understand because a lot of times economics uh, uses too much jargon and uh, I may accidentally do that, but I'll please try to help me not do that. Yeah, I'll try to bring you down. Mm -hmm. All right. But if we just want to say the very simplest thing, I mean, man is alive and uh, he's living on the earth and there's resources and uh, we can just pick up resources and make a, somehow make a living out of them, whether we're hunting or fishing or or even plant, picking uh, 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 plant life, or even planting plant life, and becoming a small, and working in farming, and so then it's very simple, right? Yeah, that that's uh, that's the easiest way to look at it. With these natural resources around us abound, and we can uh, pick them up and deliberately transform them into something else with our own design and uh, and creativity. And uh, that we normally call labor or work um, to, to do that, to change natural resources into something else or to change the results of someone else's labor into something else. And that's the two ways that we, uh, we get wealth, either that natural resources that abound already or our deliberate intervention into those natural resources. Right. So then uh, words like labor were never thought of when we were just that primitive ec uh, economy. We were just going out and, and intersecting our our uh, our world as it was and, and making it and taking what we needed to live and yeah we maybe didn't call it labor uh, but uh, eventually when we started thinking about what we're doing and in, in, in our lives uh, you know economists started theorizing and, and called it called that activity labor it is a basically essential part of life everything you know even when we, we we take a shower we make ourselves clean that that itself is labor um, but uh, we tend to think today, because we're such so trapped in a kind of a commercial economy and, and, and even a capitalist, particular kind of commercial economy that's capitalist, we tend to think that, uh, we tend to discount the labor we do for ourselves and we think of only the labor we do for, for someone else, that uh, the labor we do for our bosses or uh, at our work. So Right, so labor is just kind of like 
being alive and be, and having activity and manifesting things. And yeah, our sort of our creative impulses, uh, you know, made manifest. Made manifest, right. So then when you said commercial society or you said, I mean, that's what we're in now is a commercial society, right? Right, right. We've, we're very steeped in commerce. I mean, I sometimes think uh, one measure of how steeped it is a lot of times when people get interested in economics, they think in terms of, uh, they think in terms of, of barter or like we could only have barter, or we could have exchange through money. But <clears throat> there's another kind of economic production that goes on every day that we just don't, even, we discount so much we don't even think about, which is simply direct production where we produce for ourselves. And I think people are starting to rediscover that these days. They're, you know, finding that gardening is a, is a rewarding experience and they, uh, or they, they're buying products at home, at, at, at a home improvement store and then bringing them home and, and doing that improvement themselves and, and gaining skills they never had before through that activity. Just to honor women, we could just say doing the laundry and ironing clothes. Sure, I certainly. mean, that's all labor. Yeah, in that sense, that's all uh, yeah. activity that uh, pre uh, presents us in a way that we want to be presented. Right, and that's for all. That day. That's all direct production. Although we do rely on commodities that we purchase through commerce, through markets. Um, we we buy the washer and dryer through through the market, and uh, we buy the laundry detergent through the market, and we even buy water from our municipality through the market. But uh, then we take those inputs those raw materials into the production process and we, we produce clean laundry. And uh, so that's all productive activity. And, and the, the strange thing about discounting that work is that it really is the whole purpose of the economy. The, the whole purpose of the economy is to serve our needs, to allow us to have what we need to live to, you know, our food and, you know, all, all of the necessities of life. And so the day when we spend all that time away working for, for a, a commercial enterprise or a capitalist enterprise, um, so specifically a capitalist enterprise, uh, we, we tend to think that's the goal and we kind of invert it. We, we think that that is simply our role to work for someone else where really that activity that goes on is really meant to simply satisfy our own needs to satisfy, satisfy and support, uh, our family life and our, our just our enjoyment of our own life. Yes. And of course we can take enjoyment from work too. And from that, uh, you know, from that, that side of the creative because we can create so many things in our garage and our basement, but you know, uh, be, coming together and having a factory and, a, and certain machinery and certain flow of raw materials is also very creative. Yes, it is certainly. Um, and you know, I, I'm not trying to detract from any of that. It's just uh, I think in, in a in a capitalist economy, we tend to <clears throat> we tend to so discount our own needs um, in a kind of strange. It's a it's a strange asceticism because it. You know, it, it thinks of others, but it's thinking of others who are kind of the more powerful and the, and the, the richer. So you're thinking of the others kind of in, in a strange way. Um, and so we, we just want to work harder and, and we achieve status through that or we, we may gain privileges through that, that system, you know, that, that helps, helps us get ahead of everyone else. But, um, but it also leads us to actually discount the kind of more important parts of our, more important aspects of our lives, our families and our friends and and that sort of thing. So in order to kind of uh, understand more the commercial part or the part of, uh, of job creation and so on, uh, there's a certain money flow that we, we want to understand that somehow our company makes money. And so then it can buy the raw materials and pay us mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, pay for its facilities and so on, and also have a fund to, to uh, modernize when it has to or, or do maintenance or update or maybe even expand the market and somehow uh, we're all we're in a society together with lots of those entities and, and each one has counting on its income to uh, fulfill the needs of its the people that are working it and it and somehow there's a, a giant balance and a flow where that money goes into the company sales and out through the company's uh, what would you would you call that? Just uh, that's kind of like the basic flow of, of. Uh, Sometimes it's called the flow of funds. Sometimes in economics we use that phrase to describe uh, the way funds flow around the economy and expenditures are made. Um, and whenever we whenever we make an expenditure, we create an income for the person we're buying from. And so you have this sort of, and then that income then facilitates the productive process that creates output, economic output. So those sort of three concepts, expenditures, incomes, and output, 
or the way usually we describe this flow of funds. Is there an equation that uh, those <coughs> actually equal? Because I mean, uh... well, there's different ways of breaking it down. The common way is to talk in terms of uh, consume the type the types of expenditures that take place. So consumer expenditures are the kind of expenditures that I was talking about, which are really the the ultimate aim of I think we should think of as the ultimate aim for our economy. Those expenditures we make in order to to live and 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 reproduce our families and our lives. Um, so that's consumer sp expenditures. Then alongside that, we get investment expenditures which are the expenditures that, that commercial enterprises make in order to, uh, to increase their capacity. They're, they buy machinery or they buy vehicles uh, or they buy raw materials. And that, that's investment. That's uh, an investment expenditure. And then often we will include government spending as a separate thing. And government is kind of an investment expenditure as well. Uh, but we keep it separate as just a way of categorizing. So can you say that the cons the investment expenditures support the consumer expenditures? Uh, of course they do in one sense. Certainly, certainly. Um, the, the key thing that, uh, that the private enterprise can do for us is, is as you mentioned before, it, it can make things more efficient, bring us together in uh, assembly lines or other uh, forms of organization that, that make productivity rise. And, uh, and so that, that helps produce in a more efficient manner, the, the things that we then buy through our consumer expenditures. So they all, and the same thing, government too provides that a lot of the infrastructure, really the fundamental pieces of our economy, our roadways and our community, you know, transport networks and, uh, and simply the security uh, apparatus and the courts, which are necessary to uh, deal with contracts and other disputes. And so that infrastructural part also helps facilitate um, our consumer spending and and so a lot of times what happens is we again getting back to the same theme we end up overemphasizing we end up thinking the purpose is for to have a government or the purpose is to have this con commercial enterprise as opposed to and, and we discount our own needs um, and so I, I like to say I would like to make it so those things are serving us rather than us serving them because they especially in the commercial economy but also you'll find in government there's sort of an insatiable appetite to uh, to uh, you know, sort of uh, no end in sight in how much they will use us in order to produce more. You know, actually, profit. we talk about that a lot on, on, on uh, in our discussions because we find that it's really hard for a person to uh, to just enjoy himself. Yeah. For no reason. Yeah. You know, we enjoy ourselves so often for a reason, like we got that promotion, or we're going to get a big sale, or we're going to, you know, and okay, we we enjoy ourselves for having a grandchild or for having a child or. And then, but it's hard to enjoy ourselves every day uh, during that, the life of that child. We can en enjoy ourselves at his graduation or his birthday. Yeah. You know, we somehow have these concepts in our head that these are turning points. And it's a, and we talk about that often. That it's you know, if people could enjoy every day, uh, maybe sh focuses would shift. Yeah. But um, just to go on a little farther about what we were saying is the, um, the, the firm or the company has an income, and then from that it can pay its employees and satisfy its, its debts and so on, and satisfy its other needs. But also, if it doesn't really have enough income, then that's kind of like uh, a motivation to innovate something new in the market or some, uh, uh, have a more efficient process or somehow have a better product that would uh, attract more market. So then it, it's not always in balance, but right. it, sometimes it's out of balance and that, that out of balanceness uh, promotes innovation and growth. Uh, it does. It certainly does. Um, sometimes it gets so far out of balance. I think that's what we see today. It's so far out of balance that... Um, that the the capacity, for instance, we have about a, we're using about sixty eight percent of our, our capacity, our industrial capacity right now, meaning there's thirty two percent that's just lying there unused, and so right now we have this imbalance where consumer spending is too low, and there isn't even a there's no incentive even to innovate because there's this capacity just waiting to be used, we're just waiting for someone to step through the door and buy some more. Um, and until that happens, then there's hardly even um, too much. There is, there is also, there's always that push to kind of try to, to economize, to reduce, to increase productivity and reduce the need for workers or reduce uh, waste in the raw materials and things like that. But, um, but that, 
but that you know, can only go so far. That's not really the kind of innovation I think you're talking about, where we, we come up with whole new ideas, whole new ways of doing things that no one ever thought of before. And that's difficult to happen in, a, in an economy where consumer spending is so low and, and the effective demand has fallen off so much. Right. When, you know, when, uh, when the economy is receding, then it's kind of a lot easier to do cuts and kind of hold tight. Exactly. And then when we had a good year and we say, oh, we have a little extra money, um, there's that thing that I had in the back burner there, that idea, maybe I can just work on that and we can maybe take some positive steps this year. Yeah. And so that's much easier with some kind of... Uh, yeah, yes, indeed. In fact, maybe even in unemployment and being laid off, people, uh, ordinary workers end up thinking through things and, and coming up with new ideas and they become the next entrepreneur. Um, after uh, after where our economy returns, so I mean it's it's not it's not all bad, but it is a pain uh, I think that we go through, and it's some of it's a needless pain. Uh, it's it's uh, because of uh, the way we uh, let our economy operate. I think we, we end up with deeper recessions than we need to, um, and we we could uh, smooth that stuff out a little. Right, bit. I really want to get into that. I know that's really where kind of I'm heading, but I kind of want to lay this groundwork because sure. we're positing a balance. Let's say if there's just two companies, your company and my company, and I buy your products, and that's your income that you can pay for all your expenses and pay your employees, and you buy my products, and then from that I buy. And we're positing this balance, which is kind of like a static view of society. We've just said that when it's not in balance, then I have to innovate and make a better product so you'll buy more, right? But that's depending on that if I'm buying enough of your product also, uh, so that you'll have the money to buy more of my product. and then. And we expand that by millions of companies. And then, so in a way, we're positing that there could be an ideal state that uh, everything would be in balance and all these flows, the money would be in the loop. In mm -hmm. other words, somehow there's this loop of what I, what I gain, what I bring in is what I spend out. Right. And then you, the same happens with you. What you, uh, your income is what you spend. And then that money just keeps circling and circling around. And that's kind of what we want, isn't it? Yeah, certainly. And and when when a company receives in a revenues, the revenues are really the summation of the prices and the quantities they've sold. The multi, you know, the the multiplying of the price times the quantity, and you add that up, and that's the total revenue that that an enterprise receives. And uh, that then gets divided up after the the company receives it, as you were saying. They pay their employees, so it becomes salaries and wages. So this is all part of that flow of funds too. The the revenues become salary and wages. They become uh, the profit of the enterprise. They become uh, interest payments to bondholders for the enterprise, and so it, it breaks up into all these different components of our of incomes that we receive. And oftentimes, we we tend to think of it's not it's not a one to one uh, correlation, but we tend to think of uh, consumer spending as arising mostly from those salaries and wages. That's where uh, consumers get their income from. <clears throat> Although certainly, there's a Entrepreneur who maybe doesn't doesn't get a salary or wage and just receives some profit and uses that to make consumer spending. But overall, I tend to think of those salaries and wages as, as forming the consumer spending, and then the investment spending comes out of the uh, the profit of the enterprise or through dividends or through capital gains on stocks and these kinds of incomes, these other kinds of incomes that then go back into investment. And so that's partly <clears throat> how the imbalance can form. Because uh, you may end up with too much income going to to the profit of the enterprise and to these non-work uh, forms of income, and too little going to the uh, the compensation for workers for the salaries and wages, and that's part partly where we get this imbalance in um, too little uh, effective demand, too little consumer spending to 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 induce businesses to to invest. Well, in a way, they go seesaw. They can go seesaw like. Uh, uh it either goes to the profits or it goes to the laborers, but in a way they're tied together too. Because when the business is going bad, there's less profits and there's less uh, wages, right? Right. And then <clears throat> the other way, but but uh, we've actually posited that there could be a balance. You know that this this money could be looping through, looping through, and it could be in balance. But is it ever in balance, or is that just kind of like a, a hypothesis that went wrong, or something like that? Uh, well, I mean, when the economy is, we talk about full employment, which sometimes gets adjusted because there's a frictional unemployment where people are just moving between jobs and and doing a dutiful search, you know, trying to find the right job for themselves, and the employers are trying to find the right employee for the job. So there's there's some measure of that frictional un, uh, unemployment, um, but but when when we get down to only that 
So we are at a full employment in terms of, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're at full capacity of our economy. Uh, then uh, that's kind of where you want to be. That's that. That's where we're in balance, and uh, the, you know, the, the, at least the bad imbalances, the stuff that we could do without, uh, our, our work through. But part of the way that has to happen is through uh, through borrowing. The way our economy works today is through it's a debt driven economy. The only way to get to that point is for enough debt to be issued and enough borrowing to take place in order to move the funds that move that flow of funds from those who are who receive incomes without working to those who are who are working and, and not receiving enough income so then i kind of follow you with the debt let's see i wanted to say one thing that uh you know maybe it's instructive to look at cities because uh certain cities are attracting uh, industries and they seem to be very well off and have a good employment uh, at least they used to, and maybe even certain states are that way. Uh -huh. And other states are kind of like uh, um, have a lot of old industry or, or smaller cities that were regional powers, and then regional powers kind of evaporated, and it went to it, uh, uh, concentration happened. I'm thinking of uh, cities like Savannah, Georgia, uh, uh -huh. that has a lot of board had a lot of boarded up places downtown, uh, like Erie, Pennsylvania. Uh, like uh, well, even Detroit, I think, is is has a, a pretty derelict uh, downtown, and and uh, uh, and then there's other uh, uh, cities that are able to attract a wide variety of of uh, of industry, and they actually talk in a way like they're bringing ca new capital into the into the area, where the other ones are just trying to that don't have any basic industries are just trying to live on a service economy uh, by selling groceries and and uh, and and paying your power bill and somehow there's no new money created so that they're the ones that are net exporters it's almost like a country but you know you can see that, that cities are are well off and some cities are uh, Greensboro North Carolina is a city that they've been trying to reconstruct downtown for years uh-huh yeah yeah, well, so in other words, what I'm saying is there's not really a balance, but somehow you have to be aggressive and you have to be a, an exporter uh, and getting new money in. Yeah, certainly. The, the, yeah. Is that true or is that? Uh... Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, it's, it's really a good. We, we sometimes focus on specialization too much um, in, in the economics. We talk about the division of labor, which allows any one of us to specialize in one thing. You become a plumber or you become a firefighter or you become an attorney. So you specialize, and in doing that, you you create better better efficiency for the whole economy by by gaining the skills necessary. And the same thing can happen with a city. So a city can specialize in in uh, in auto manufacturing like Detroit, um, or steel like Pittsburgh, and and they specialize in that. And they produce you know the, at one time produced the steel for much of the world, um, or Gary, Indiana, um, or they produce the automobiles for much of the world and. They specialize so much, though, that they, it also hobbles them in other aspects of, of the economy. And, uh, and they become so dependent on that, if that auto automobile sales trail off, Detroit hurt, hurts much more than anyone else. So I think we have to strive for some kind of balance. So that, so that, and, and, and that balance actually creates a self-sufficiency, where each city, by, by trying to focus on balance, creates uh, the conditions for it to produce its own needs uh, within the, the very metropolitan area that, the, uh, for each city. And that doesn't end trade. It's not trying to stop trade, but, but simply puts each city in a position to be in a better bargaining position to trade with anyone else, because if they need to, they can rely on themselves, uh, become self-reliant cities um, and uh, not... Well, the worst part about specialization is if an industry becomes mature or like kind of obsolete. And then there, or even uh, you know, the old line uh, uh, factories uh, when they're forty and fifty and sixty years old, they're they're not at the same technology of new ones, and so then you're hobbled with a whole bunch of old structures that uh, there doesn't seem to be enough liquidity to to uh, modernize them. Yeah, certainly the city can become uh, subject to the whims or the failures of the you know the only industry that, that the uh, textile cities are a classic yeah, example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, and there's a lot, there's, sometimes there's reasons to specialize, uh, you know, uh, we can't produce uh, teak forests here in Illinois, so there are certain things that we have to rely on elsewhere, but there are a lot of things that we could produce uh, locally, and that's part of the sort of sustainable agriculture movements to produce more of our, uh, our agricultural needs closer to home. Um, 
and that all improves the self-sufficiency of the of the region. So you were saying that uh, uh, consumption, uh, or like uh, income that's destined toward consumption, and income that was or destined toward uh, investment. And the investment to me seemed like it came out of surplus income. In other words, uh, if some kind of an entity could have extra income that they didn't need to spend for consumption, then they would have to, you know, they would they would put that they would be able to put that into some kind of an investment and uh, actually it would behoove them to do it otherwise they would they would just what would they do with it they would just buy goods or buy land or somehow they put their money in the bank and that's where debt comes in right because uh out of uh excess in income uh somehow that's put into a bank and that's uh that's available for investment. Yeah, and even more importantly, it's the structural debt that I like to focus on because uh, when, because we've created certain uh, forms of property that, that transfer uh, income from those who work to those who don't work. I'm thinking specifically of stocks and corporations. Uh, you can imagine if you own a stock, if you own enough stock, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to contribute at all to the economy. You just collect dividends or capital gains from, from the playing with those stocks. And also natural resources where you didn't produce a natural resource, you didn't produce the earth, you didn't produce the oil reserve yourself, um, and you didn't contribute to that, but you still can, by claiming ownership of that, you can, you can then receive incomes from other people, uh, the work, receive the fruits of others' labor. So if you own mineral rights or, or uh, water rights or, uh, or just uh, forestry, forests. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So that, those sort of... Uh, income claims, those sort of property claims allow us, uh, you know, basically end up distributing incomes from those who work to those who don't work. And that helps create this imbalance. It creates a, a tendency to concentrate wealth further because when you receive incomes without working and other people receive that, therefore retain less of their own uh, labor, fruits of their labor, um, that, that creates this concentration of wealth. And it starts, it, it's a tendency that once it starts, it's uh, very difficult to reverse. In other words, it has a positive feedback loop that it keeps. In other words, let's just exactly. kind of like put, uh, put this in, 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 in the way we, we were just speaking. In other words, we were talking about a loop, right? That uh, somehow consumption uh, uh, allows people to have income, which allows them to consume again. And then now we're saying that uh, people that have uh, larger incomes can't consume that amount. And so that income comes off out of the stream and so then the stream is diminished somehow and right and uh, and somehow we have to pump it back up so what are they going to do with that money that's excess well they're going to put it in a bank and a bank is created to uh, by laws that say there's a thing called interest and that uh, if they take that money and and let people use it uh, we say they can have some interest and that interest is another thing that's pulled off the stream Exactly. And then it that, goes to those lending. Yeah. And yeah. people maybe also invest in stock. And then uh, if they get a dividend off the stock, that's more money that comes out of this, this right. loop or this circle. And we're saying that, well, oh, maybe eventually they put it back in. Uh, in fact, they put it back in right away. Probably when they get money, they put it in the bank. And supposedly it's invested somehow and they get more interest. So then there's a positive feedback loop where they, where their uh, excess income actually becomes more excess. And Right, exactly. And, and so this idea that, that those incomes normally go to investment um, kind of breaks down because investment isn't merely just finding new ways of doing things. It's simply applying the old ways of doing things in a larger scale. You just simply build another factory just like the old factory or, or much like the old factory. But to do that, you also have to have demand from consumers who, wanna, who want to uh, buy the goods that that factory would produce. And that's where structural debt becomes really important because once once you get to the point where you're producing enough in the existing factories that to meet all of consumer demand, the incentive to invest in new factories falls off, you know, dramatically. And now the uh, the banks and the inter financial intermediaries are left to find new borrowers that aren't interested in investment at all. They're, they have to find someone else who will borrow those funds that are collecting in this concentration of wealth, and. Uh, Originally, <clears throat> uh, this problem became very acute, and maybe earlier too, but it certainly uh, it's clear it became acute in the 1920s, where uh, they were basically loaning funds to, to any, anybody who wanted to trade in the stock market so they could buy on margin. So they didn't even ha you didn't even have to have any funds to be able to invest in the stock market. The bank was happy to loan you 
uh, a margin account and let get you started investing in stocks. And that helped, of course, you know, cause the stock market uh, bubble in the 1920s, which collapsed in 1929. And that was the first way of trying to find an outlet for this structural debt. Um, and then after the stock market crash, <clears throat> then economists put forth the idea that we could use the government could, to take on this, uh, this structural debt. They could borrow. And uh, as long as they borrowed, uh, they, they could borrow where the debt would grow and grow, but as long as it grew slower than the economy, they told us anyway that we shouldn't be concerned, that it would always be a shrinking, the debt would always be a shrinking proportion of the, of the total output, even though it was growing as well. Um, and of course, later that we started to realize that maybe growth wasn't something that could go on forever and, and we, should be, we shouldn't just be pursuing growth for growth's sake. Um, and so that created some problems there. So in other words, wealth became concentrated because it was, there was a mechanism to siphon some off, right? right? First of all, people were making more money through ownership. They were making more money than they could possibly spend. And so then that accumulated uh, capital. And then that capital, you're not going to just put it in your mattress. They had to develop banking systems and stock systems and places to put that. Right. And that just kept fe feeding more into that uh, excess capital, let's call it. You know, not a bad thing or not a good thing. We don't know what it is. It's just a state that there was a, there was excess money there that wasn't being spent. And so then it got to a point where for the products that we know how to make today, there's no need for any extra factories, you know. And then some people are working on new products, new generations. And, of course, nowadays they're doing a lot. But, I mean, okay, at a certain time they weren't really that fast at in, 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 new innovations. So then they still had gobs of money that they, that they, they weren't going to build a factory with. And what are they going to do? So then they started to uh, say, okay, well, the government could issue debt and we could buy that and make interest on that so that this money, this excess capital was working somehow. So with the excess wealth and uh, needing a, a place to be invested, then investment vehicles are actually created for that. And then those investment vehicles somehow uh, allow that excess wealth to work in a sense. Now, it might not be working in what we call a productive economy. It might be working in, in trading schemes and uh, back and forth schemes where not much value is really added. It makes a certain amount of liquidity possible. But uh, this brings us to really... Uh, look take a good look at market forces because uh, in one sense we like to have uh, stable prices but the market when we talk about stock love to have prices that are going up right exactly. <laughs> and they're not necessarily looking for stable prices well those those who uh, work in the stock market they actually like them to be volatile because they know they can't make them go up continuously but they can make them fluctuate wildly and it's in the fluctuation that the speculator can make, uh, the sort of predatory speculators can make the most money. Um, you get the you get the others to panic, prices uh, drop, and you buy up what they had, and the stock price rises again. And it's a lot easier to push them down than it is to pull them up. So <laughs> that's usually the... All you have to do is run to them, and that pulls them up, right? It does, certainly. It yeah. doesn't really have to do with the value of the company. It just has to do with how many people are willing to go there. Right. You know, if it, maybe I, if, if you're like me, you get these emails uh, regularly telling you, I'm giving you this inside tip, buy this stock, and uh, right. you know, it's meant to, to try to drive up that stock price. No, but I mean, uh, I think I just read that Apple had the, the, the most earnings in any quarter ever, and their stock price went down. Yeah, yeah. That that's often happens too, um, but I think because uh, people just decided that uh, since they're so damn big, there's no way they could keep growing like they grew because there's no market left for them to to take over. It's in a be, sense. Yeah, I think there also there's also concern that Steve Jobs was a major factor in uh, keeping that company going. So, so we're just saying as uh, as capital accumulates, it it somehow outgrows the need for capital. Is, are, are we saying that as far as the productive economy goes for, for the short term, it outgrows? It does. Well, but I think it, it's important to understand that it, it grows so rapidly because of the particular property uh, re relations that government creates. So by creating these uh, stocks and corporations and, uh, and ownership of natural resources in particular, I think those are two key ones to think about. It creates the conditions where where the wealth is concentrating, and therefore uh, new kinds of debt have to be 
uh, we get that imbalance between consumer spending and investment spending and government spending. That and that imbalance creates the need to find to actually loan to government or loan to consumers. Eventually, that's what we did too. We came up with consumer debt as a kind of a whole new uh, solution to the structural debt problem. Well, that was a good con good. I think that was good f uh, since the. Uh, I think you're sp speaking of homes, right? And like the FHA and so on that guaranteed mortgages, and that and was after the Second World War where somehow there was an ideal that everyone sh had a right or should have an opportunity to own a home? Uh, certainly, that's that's part of it, but it's not it's not the whole thing. There's, I'm, I'm, again, there's debt, which I have no problem with. I think, you know, taking out a mortgage makes perfect sense. You have something that took an awful lot of effort, concentrated effort to build and will last, you know, a century. Um, so why not finance it over a, an extended period of time? That makes perfect sense. But because of the, this is also servicing that structural debt problem, there's a need to get people to borrow more for their homes and uh, to to engage in land speculation to drive up the land prices. Even though there's nothing going into the land, it's just simply uh, allows banks and and speculate land speculators to siphon off incomes uh, for themselves and and uh, and then increases uh, borrowing as well. Let's just talk a little bit about, more about structural debt because you mentioned that a couple of times, and I want to exactly see how that fits in the structure. Okay. I mean, you're saying it's like needed because because why? Because because of the concentration of wealth, there's certain uh, people who will who will receive incomes from their wealth without working, without contributing to the economy. Just by holding that wealth, they'll receive income so large, they can't possibly consume it. That they, they they may buy a couple houses, they may have a summer house in Greece, or uh, a few yachts, or, or you know, private jets. They, they 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 spend all that money, but there's still an enormous excess that they can't possibly spend. And so the only way to then for the economy to keep going is for them to find someone to borrow, whether that's for investment or whether it's the government or whether it's consumers. And so we end up with that. That is the structural debt. It's a debt that has to grow, has to exist, has to uh, and can never be repaid. Um, it can be repaid in kind of a whack-a-mole kind of way. One person will get their mortgage finally paid off. But once they do, the bank understands that it's vital for them immediately to get that those funds loaned again to someone else. But there's also that growing structural debt, so they also have to find someone else to borrow. So it's it it's constantly growing, even when some places here or there it gets paid off, paid down. So the whole uh, banking scheme is just a growing necessity. So it it's growing number one as as, as capital concentrates, and uh, actually we've kind of like almost. In a way, we've really dampened it because interest is so low now that it almost doesn't even make any difference if you're lending out or not, right? It's true. Interest rates are very low, and some people blame like the Federal Reserve for that. But again, when you have so many people wanting to loan because their incomes are so high they can't spend it all, and they're struggling, they're, they're struggling to find new innovations, new people to borrow to who will borrow from them, then it's it's kind of a, it's not a surprise that interest rates would be very low. So this is clear. This is worldwide. This is a worldwide co uh, condition. This has nothing to do with just the economy of the United States or any yeah. kind of local phenomena. No, no. I mean, I think some of the problems we're seeing uh, in in Europe with Greece and Italy and Spain and, and so it's debtor de nations taking on an awful lot of debt. That's part of this problem. And it, it's not to say that uh, there isn't something irresponsible going on in those places, but because because we have this debt-driven economy, and there, there are irresponsible countries, there are irresponsible cities, there are irresponsible people, but because we have this debt-driven economy, it's those irresponsible people, those irresponsible entities that are actually helping our economy go. And so even those who are taking on no debt owe some debt of gratitude <laughs> to those who are taking on the debt to keep their jobs in place and keep the economy rolling. This is almost a mind blower. What's coming to me is like uh, even foreign aid is not something that we're just having a big heart and we're just digging into our deep pockets and saying, oh, we need to lend that money. It's and we true. have to uh, find somebody needy in order to borrow it. Yes, yes. Is yeah. it, it's just like that, isn't it? And yeah. it's national policy to somehow to find a needy nation and somehow force them to take our excess capital, and even if they pay 1% or 2% interest or something, and somehow guarantee it by the world IMF or something, or uh, somehow protect our our our, uh, our holders of that capital, our our domestic uh, rich people. We have to protect them the best we can, but we have to find a way to uh, 
to send that money out somewhere and get it to so-called work. Yeah, and, and I think that that's part of the, probably the more disturbing part of the structural debt problem is that one of the solutions we've found easier and easier to go with is lending to buy armaments. And, uh, and our entire defense apparatus is growing so rapidly because it is such an effective way of, of loaning funds <clears throat> that don't really do anybody any good, usually. Um, they, they're actually very destructive of cities and towns and, and countries. And, uh, but it, 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 find, it places an outlet for this structural debt to find a, a borrower. And we borrow funds to buy planes and weapons and, and missiles and, and those simply then get used up and then we can buy more. And it's not, it kind of, it takes it out of the normal everyday economy that, that uh, might actually be helping someone. Well, actually, the, um, the, the worker in the armament plan, it's helping, and he's putting it back in, right? But, I mean, they're selling the same arms to both sides of the conflict. Yes. And so then <laughs> it's just kind of like a new way to kill instead of just uh, battling it out with sticks and stones or with, with rifles. Uh, now we got uh, shoulder-launched missiles. Exactly. And then also you destroy the city, and now you can borrow funds to, to rebuild the city. Um, and and re, you know replace some of that infrastructure that's been destroyed. We build schools in Afghanistan and things like that too. And we're saying that is all due to the concentration of wealth. The fact that we concentrate wealth, we have to find a place to put that wealth as that that makes it work, which means somewhere that would bear interest, that would bear dividends, that would bear something. And because of the con concentration of wealth, the world is in a fix. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there there are other obviously there are other reasons that are given and and. And since and they're even sincere about why we might go to war in one place or another, but um, but I think that behind it there is that structural debt problem, and and there's a need you know there's a need to find reasons to start a war, or find reasons to attack another country that that are help that help drive that motivating those other motivations. Yeah. Whether there's a need or not, at least it's very helpful if we could, <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly. One question would be. Uh, there is a kind of a consumption-driven economy, or there's our gross national product. I don't know whether you want to take the armaments part out of it, or the, the ones that we've kind of tagged as due in part to structural debt. But there is a kind of a, an economy that, that keeps us all alive and, and clothes us and feeds us and, and houses us and, uh, and educates us and, and so on. What is the size of that economy compared to the economy of traders and, and instruments? And uh, you know, I mean, are they equal, or are, is this is the excess capital a way bigger economy than the than the actual worldwide growth gross national product? Uh, I'm not up on the exact statistics today, but there is a concern that um, that we're getting too much into an economy that's uh, what what we economists call rent-seeking economy. Uh, rent-seeking is not referring to rents that we might pay for to our landlord for our apartment, but it's a rent in, in a natural resource. It's a, the, the revenue someone receives by controlling a, a natural resource, a monopoly resource, either one. And of course, a natural resource, by controlling that, it is kind of a monopoly. So the revenue someone receives for that, which obviously aren't from their producing that natural resource, that that's a rent. And so rent-seeking is, is kind of about shuffling uh, claims to property around. Um, if you can, uh, if you're running an insurance, a medical insurance company, and you can deny legitimate claims for insurance, um, that's that's a form of rent seeking. So you might hire workers, a whole army of workers, who uh, whose job it is simply to find excuses to deny legitimate claims, and uh, that's not producing anything productive. You know, it doesn't nothing. Uh, we don't gain anything in the economy from that. That simply shuffles. Uh, assets or wealth from those who are injured and or need medical insurance to those to the insurance company itself. Well, we have a lot of lawyers that, you know, we hire to uh, to figure out how not to pay taxes. And yeah. so then that's another thing that Right, that's another form of yeah, an accountants and It's and, like a rent seeking then, right? That is that is rent seeking as well and even the speculative uh, stuff that goes on in Wall Street and LaSalle Street um, where you're simply uh, I mean there, there's a there's a financial service function that goes into that you are providing uh in derivatives you're providing kind of an insurance uh policy but much of the activity that goes into it is is really focused on just moving the claims around and trying to it seems like derivatives i mean what uh what value does that add to society i mean it does now from what we understand it does a lot uh, give an outlet to that excess capital 
and uh, derivatives are one way and it seems like it depends on a kind of a, a bed of suckers you know that yeah. uh, people that are too slow to move because it's really a zero sum game isn't it yeah, well, yeah it is I, but there are, there are there is a function a necessary social function provided by derivative markets but it's just it's probably not the best way to do it we could provide insurance pools uh, that simply pooled the, the the funds of those who have to hedge risks, the farmers who are selling uh, their wheat and, and need to know that they can have a decent price for it, and the cereal manufacturers who are buying that wheat and need to know they can have a, a decently low price for it. So you put those two together into a pool, a risk pool, and pool their funds. And if something goes wrong for either one of them, you can pay out and, and, and manage that in a much, much uh, simpler way. Um, that doesn't involve derivatives and doesn't involve an entire uh, army of, of traders, of speculative traders that are, you know, doing all this excess work that isn't necessary. So uh, part of it is it does provide an outlet for it, but it provides an outlet that is, again, uh, it's, it has a bad feedback on the whole system because, it, it again, it's just transferring and concentrating wealth. Again, I, you know, it would be interesting to know and, and uh, uh, what percentage of, the market that, of this trading and derivatives and so on is actually useful for people that need to hedge. And what percentage of it is just a, a game that people are playing uh, and, and doing arbitrage, basically. It means like finding something somewhere in the world that costs a little bit less than somewhere else in the world and then switching them over yeah. and being that middleman that switches them over. But I don't see how that adds any value whatsoever. That just kind of like uh, taking advantage of some kind of... Uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, anomalies of the system. Yeah, well, if you do it the way we, we're doing it with, uh, with derivative markets, then that, that arbitrage really does serve a useful function. But the question I'm trying to raise is whether that's the best way we could be doing this. That's, if that's not the best way to, to hedge risks, but if we instead use a, a, a government-provided risk pool um, to do most of it, then, then all of the activity, all of the, the labor that goes into that rent-seeking <clears throat> is just wasted activity, and it's activity that could either lift burdens on everyone by shortening our work weeks, or, uh, or um, you know, actually producing more things for everyone to to buy. I'd like to ask about uh, the free market because the market is a place where people bring their goods and services, and other people come to seek those goods and services, and somehow there's this supply and this demand that we believe seek a balance uh, somehow. Mm -hmm. And uh, in one sense, we would like to have stable prices because we'd like to know what we're doing. But uh, all the farmers' crops come in at the same time. So then there's an excess supply, possibly, at that time. And it seems like the only way it really works for the manufacturer is if there's some kind of natural or enforced scarcity of products uh, so that uh, uh, if supply is too big uh, nobody wants that much of anything and it's not worth producing anymore but yet I spent all last winter producing these things and uh, I'm stuck holding the bag on something that's uh, and that uh, and then we have to get into something called hedging to see if uh, but that's not because the there was no intrinsic value on food stocks or on on things that I made, but just that at this moment everyone's making yeah. them. And having markets is a good thing. It's the best way we found to produce things uh, that, that require cooperation, that require a division of labor, and uh, and so it's very useful to have markets. Um, and when you do that, you have sort of an uncoordinated activity where every producer, every farmer, say, of uh, producing grain is trying to do the best they can. They're trying to produce as much grain as they can possibly produce, given, uh, you know, the, the set aside the land they set aside and, and uh, put in rotation and things like that. But that means that uncoordinated activity has to be coordinated by the market and by, um, by an insurance pool, by a risk fund um, that he allows them to hedge so that when they all do really well, um, because they tend to do well together when, based on the weather and, and uh, you know, the climate. So when they all do well together, that there's some way to, to manage that because, I mean, food obviously is a fundamental thing we all need. And uh, so we really all benefit from having, uh, you know, suppliers of that food that uh, don't have to face undue risk that they shouldn't 
be forced to shoulder themselves. So people are trying to foresee what that market will be too, because you know you said that uh, farmers are trying to produce as much grain as they can, but not necessarily. They're they're trying to uh, produce, you know, depending on where, where they think the market's going to fall, and then they're trying to produce alternative crops, maybe, or trying to find some alternative crops, or you know, manufacture same thing. I mean, we're not all making. Uh, iPads or something like that. We're making, trying to make something new, new and different. Yeah, I mean, I think we're starting to see a concentration even in agriculture. But they, in, in the past, anyway, the farms were so small or, that they couldn't really affect the market that much. So they were basically what economists call price takers. They just take the price of the market, and they don't affect it. They they can't produce so much themselves that they would change the price. So they just try to produce as much as they can produce given their conditions. And then whatever the price is, that'll that'll determine their revenues. Um, so that you know, that there's, but now we're seeing a concentration of agriculture where you're having seeing Cargill and, and these giant uh, agricultural enterprises that probably can affect the market. They they can make decisions about well, if we, we can produce less or we can produce more, or they focus on ethanol and they're trying to you know supplant oil, the oil industry and and find new ways that because. There's a the demand if they can sell to us for our energy needs, our, our vehicle energy and things like that, that they can, you know, sell for a much higher price than they, they otherwise would. It's kind of like innovating a new product, but in another way, it has to do with that excess capital. They got an excess capital of grain, and they have to invest it somewhere. Yeah, finding right? a new it's use. It's almost a structural yeah. debt. That the, uh, is it close to that or something like that? Uh, it might be. I mean, because there's, you are seeing that concentration um, of of agriculture in, into a few hands and that that's where before uh, the you know small farmer was just happy to they would just bring everything and they could sell everything they produced but it might be at a lower price than they wanted but now you're seeing these large conglomerate agricultural enterprises where they they're seeking out new markets they want to find new uses for their product um, and that's why you know we're seeing corn syrup go into everything supplanting sugar and things because the, the corn industry in, in the United States is so powerful but you see what I mean by the uh, the distribution system of the market. The free market is always based on scarcity, and you know maybe that's good for a lot of products, and maybe some products like when we talk about healthcare, and if we want it to be universal, then there shouldn't be scarcity there. And so maybe somehow that money system or that free market system is not a very good way to distribute things that we don't want to be scarce. Yeah, well, the, with the case of insurance and all insurance really, including the kind of insurance we're talking about, this price insurance that farmers need. Um, these are natural monopolies, uh, what, what economists call natural monopolies. And what that means is that the cost structure is such that the larger the, the operation grows, the lower the costs are, the average costs and the marginal costs fall off dramatically. So, um, <clears throat> you know, if you, you can imagine if you have uh, an insurance fund, you're collecting in premiums from people and you need, you need uh, accountants and actuarials to kind of determine how big that fund needs to be in order to meet the risks that people are, are hedging against, the, the risks that they're trying to insure against cat, those catastrophic events, as insurance companies call them. So you, you can imagine that if, if you have two different funds, you have to hire basically the same staff in each of them to, do, to do, perform those calculations. And they, of course, that's proprietary information. They try to hide it from their competitors. So you basically have doubled the bureaucracy required um, when, you, when you try to create a competitive market out of it. And they, they know even, the, the, the financial industry knows that the bigger they grow, the more efficient they get. And that's sometimes why they clamor against regulation. They don't want it. They say, why are you regulating us? We can be more efficient if you stop regulating us. <clears throat> but don't the, they make mistakes? You know, like the actuarial would be going on a certain theory, <clears throat> right? And then some other uh, different competitor might say, well, that theory, we don't trust it so much. So we're going to, you know. Oh, certainly. Uh, th those kind of mistakes happen, I'm sure, all the time. And there's there's ways of internally trying to deal with those. You can have a, a peer review, as you know, out of academia, where you you have different people doing the calculations separately and compare them. And if there's some discrepancy, then you know that you need to look into where that discrepancy arose. And uh, so there are lots of ways to do that. But um, but the the key is that since it's a natural monopoly, <clears throat> they'll tend to concentrate and and. The, the monopoly is actually a good thing in this case. In the case of a natural monopoly, it's a good thing. When you can have it one operation, it's much more efficient. You can, you can put in redundancies if you need to, or you can put in that kind of peer review if you need to um, internally, but it's much more efficient to have it all in one, one place. 
The problem, though, with natural monopolies is when you allow them to be privatized. Now you're give, basically giving what should be a, a governmental power because you're going to have a single. You can't rely on the free market in that case. So since you can't rely on the free market, if you make it private, you're handing over a governmental power to a privileged monopolist who now can wield it at their whim. They can use that market power to constrain markets, other markets that they that that are that need to use that monopoly, and they can use it to manipulate the markets and they they create what they call partners. And the partners get special treatment, you know. So it's very different than when we put things in government. We expect equal protection of the law. We expect everyone to have equal access to that governmental service. When it's privatized monopoly, there's no expectation of equal access. Now the the monopolists can anoint other partners to become monopolists in places that there wouldn't be a monopoly. And that's what we see, for instance, with the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve has been uh, handed over this privilege to operate the monopoly of our monetary system. And with that, they anoint banks to be too big to fail, where there would be no no monopoly. You know, banks are not really they're not a natural monopoly. Um, it's only the certain privileges that we're extending to private interests that allow them to create monopolies in these places where a monopoly would not otherwise exist. We also said that there's a, a monopoly. Anyone that's big enough to uh, affect a market, because we we said that uh, individual farmers were price takers, but Cargill and Archer Daniels and uh, other big uh, agricultural conglomerates can affect the market. So in a way, they've taken a governmental power to affect the market, or they've just exercised a, a power which perhaps should be reserved for the government. Yeah, I think, so. well, I think there are there are three areas that I usually talk about that are natural monopolies. It's, it's our insurance programs, for the reasons I explained before. There's transport networks. So anytime we're transporting anything, it can be you know vehicles or passengers or freight or pedestrians or or data packets over the internet, uh, or modulated frequencies, you know, for broadcast. All of these things are transport networks, and so those are a necessary monopoly. They're a natural monopoly. And then the other thing is is natural resources. And uh, so when so we, resources like power and gas and electricity and well, the natural resources. So like I'm talking about the the fossil fuel deposits or mineral deposits or uh, other natural resource deposits in the earth: gold, silver, you know, iron aluminum, all of these things you find in the earth. And, and then the earth itself, the very surface of the earth is a natural resource. And it's something that, that we treat as a commodity, but it's a commodity like no other. It's not something anyone can produce themselves. You know, they, we, it's just sort of our, our allotment of, of natural resources that we all have, the commonwealth, sometimes it's called. And uh, so to allow uh, sort of that unfettered control of those natural monopoly resources is where we also create other problems for ourselves, including eventually we create the structural debt problem. Um, but we also create the possibility for monopolization um, as, uh, as Cargill or ADM can, can create, uh, can use sort of natural monopoly tendencies, little components <clears throat> that could be provided by government to instead create a monopoly of the land and and control that uh, for themselves and, and wield it against us, you know. So it's no longer a free markets; it's manipulated markets. It's markets controlled by monopoly interests. In the beginning, we were talking about the consumer, uh, kind of like a cons- we were actually talking about labor, and we were just saying the things we do for ourselves. Sometimes we don't even think of that as labor, and that actually uh, the labor we'd think about of going to work is really should be designed to support our lifestyle. And uh, I was just thinking like in the tradition where all our actually economic systems grew up in, let's say that there's a a third generation factory and it's grown, uh, not to make too much history about it, but just let's say it's up even around 20 or 30 or 50 million dollars now. In a, in a in a mid-sized Ohio town, and uh, and the whole family and several generations of the family work there, and hundreds of employees work there, and they're they're pretty modern and so on, as far as what kind of product they have and how they sell it and how they distribute it, but still that company is very much in sync and in in uh, with the community, and it's still serving, and it, it probably even has ideals of uh, how we serve our employees and we have daycare centers here and we, you know, somehow we serve our community and they, they might be members of the Rotary and members of, you know, the YMCA and they're giving to 
uh, different charities and different uh, children's events and schools and supporting the university and so on and so on. And they're actually, uh, they're very much in sync with that, that community that they're, they're paying taxes, they're, uh, you know, and they're dip relying on that labor market, uh, they're supporting that college, uh, they're maybe doing research with that college and so on and so on. And then they get bought. And they get bought by this ac accumulated capital that we were talking about, that this, this uh, excess wealth. And now, instead of 100% uh, of this family being tied into this community, never thinking of leaving it, no way they could ever even leave it. There's no way they could really finance or get liquid enough without uh, issuing stock and so on. There's no way they could really rebuild everything from ground zero. But some big group comes in there. And now this factory of 50 million is 1% of this big group. And they don't have any allegiance to anywhere. And they're gonna, they hold that community uh, at ransom and say, look, we're closing this factory down. You give us a 20-year ho tax holiday. We have to lay off half your, your people here. Because just like you said with the insurance company, they do the actuaries or they do the other stuff somewhere else. And they do the accounting somewhere else and the billing somewhere else. And the, and the sales force is located somewhere else. And, you know, and then they have all these other, maybe 100 other industries that are all supporting this huge cash flow that actually they could say, well, let's just shut this down and we'll move over to some new town that'll give us a 20 year tax holiday. And uh, by the way, they're a non-union town. And uh, this old factory that's 40 or 50 years old, uh, let's, it's about time we got rid of that anyhow. And then uh, they just kind of like, uh, they're traders and choppers, you know, they just chop up what they get and then they they take the goods and, uh, and they, they've got the, the, the structural capital that allows them to do that, where the third generation guy didn't have, you know, he was making a good living and all. Right. So then we're, we live in a, in a totally different atmosphere of where our institutions grew up. Yeah, yeah. certainly, certainly. And I think part of it is we've, we've misappropriated the power over these. Over and we've these divorced facts. it from the community, totally divorced it. Right, right. You know, I mean, I, I tend to think of, uh, you know, from traditional law, from British law, we, 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 where we get the idea of a corporation. And a corporation was, was any kind of collective or enduring, uh, was, was an entity to satisfy any collective or enduring need. You know, so a, a town was a corporation, a city is a corporation. The colonies, the original 13 colonies of, of America were, were also corporations. And um, so there were certain kinds of corporations where we would have, would have never... And traditionally, none of the corporations, we would have ever thought of sole selling ownership of them. They were simply a way of organizing our collective needs. And so it was kind of a strange opportunistic innovation that, that thought of selling stock in that corporation. Uh, was there just no ownership or was it just uh, uh, understood that everyone owns it? I, I think uh, I think it didn't really have the modern conceptions of ownership that we that we uh, all take for granted today. I think it was just simply something that was there. It existed, you know, like, you know, if you think of a, a city of here in, in Forest Park, it's no one ever really thinks that they own the town. I mean, maybe maybe they, they think of that a little bit, but I think it's more just it just is. It's just yeah, we just town. become a resident and a taxpayer. And right. then we're a citizen because we pay taxes to this. And you, and you live here. And yeah. the resident only takes 90 days or whatever. Right, right. So, well, weren't the original 13 colonies actually uh, commercial uh, charters that England gave certain uh, trading companies? or There, there were work? those, too, the long side of it. I mean, the East India Trading Company was a separate kind of corporation, um, but the, there was the, the Virginia was a corporation in Connecticut and New York, and these were chartered by the, the King of England uh, through Parliament. But the understanding was it was the king's, you know, prerogative to to charter a corporation. To and and of course, the, it was not unusual then to charter a monarchical or an oligarchical corporation to say, "You're the governor of Connecticut. That's it. We're done. There's no election goes on or anything." So part of the uh, the American Revolution was a recognition that we should have local rule and we should have uh, republican governance, as they called it, or we call it democracy today. We should have democracy in these colonies. And we should decide our own fate here locally. And so they suppl supplanted that governor appointed and instead put together constitutions in each and created states. And, and, uh, and each colony became a state and became an, uh, one with a Republican form of govern governance. And I think we should have thought of a, a corporate enterprise, uh, except for, you know, you have the East India Company and these early uh, enterprise corporations that uh, 
kind of set set us on the wrong path and where we actually sold stock in them. And I think instead we should have thought of it as another way for government to organize our collective enduring needs of production, allow them to be separate, allow them to be private, but at the same time not allow them to be owned, but rather be financed through bond issue, uh, just through borrowing. Um, and not when the king said that you're the governor of Rhode Island, he probably said, he didn't say that you own Rhode Island. He said, I own Rhode Island, right? I uh, mean, it's my colony and you're just uh, the governance. Yeah, he thought of it, as, run it right? he thought of it as his domain. Uh, so it's different than ownership because one of the things we think of a key aspect of ownership is what, what uh, the legal profession calls alienation. So when you can sell something, you can alienate it, you can make it someone else's property. That's where ownership comes in. The king never thought of some of the colonies as something he could alienate. It was his domain always. He could take it from the governor and give it to a different governor. He could restructure them and, and reshape the boundaries of them. He could do all that, but he couldn't actually sell them off. He couldn't. Wasn't make them there not the Louisiana territory that we bought from France? It, it was from France, but again, that was after the French Revolution. That was after these new innovations in natural resource stewardship had begun, where uh, where the the King of France had been, you know, supplanted also, and so now, an an alienation was starting to occur with natural resources. They were starting to treat natural resources just like any other commodity, not as something of the domain of government, but as rather something just just like a you know a bottle of whiskey or something. You could just alienate it. So, so I mean, talking about the French Revolution, I, you know, in our preamble it says. Uh, right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. But wasn't that originally uh, life, liberty, and property? And we didn't. We decided that we didn't want to say that you could have property. That's not part of our constitution or... or well, we... then life, liberty, and property, that phrase does show up in the constitution again. Uh, you know, it, it's not a question of, of so much... Uh, again, property is all, uh, often a very central part of, of our, our polity, the way we relate to each other as citizens. But, um, but there's a difference in, you know, what can be property? What can you own? You know, can you own a person? You know, that was something you could do early on. Can you, could you own natural resources to the extent of being able to alienate them, to sell them to someone else? Or was it something granted to you? I mean, that's what title was. It was a grant, a temporary grant from your superior, the king maybe, um, which granted you that use of that land, use of that natural resource, including the right to, to extract rents and taxes from those who you subgranted, you sublicensed uh, that land, or to extract the mineral riches, or yeah, so on. we all, have a, we have a, somehow a lease or a, a lease to uh, to work the mineral rights on certain lands and to explore for oil and gas and right, exactly. And, and I mean that's often what the explorers were; they were going and claiming the new lands as the domain of their of their king, whoever uh, sponsored them. In some senses, we say there's rights to alienate uh, much property, right? And then when it comes to something like our imbalance of trade, and it turns out that China has so many dollars and it's, they're not very worth very much as a deposit in somebody's bank account, and they want to come over here and just buy a lot of land and buy a lot of buildings, and and we're wondering if that's a right that they have to buy it. Uh, it can we alienate and they, to a foreign national or a foreign uh, actually a foreign nation. And uh, so then that's where kind of like alienation is breaking down, right? I, that's a very interesting point you raise. I mean, because it does, I think, highlight the, the kind of uh, the contradictions in, in allowing that kind of alienation. You know, if you imagine what if China, like the, you, the federal government today owns 25% of the land in, 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 the nor in North America, in our national forests and our national parks. You know, if you imagine what if China bought that you know what if they own they could do it easily right <laughs> so, i mean they've got that liquid, so kind of, liquidity to do right, it, right it breaks down what it means to be a nation if if, if china owned 100 percent of the land in north america you know then in what sense are we the united states of america um and and we're seeing that even you know that there's it's one way to think of it in terms of foreigners but even domestically if if one person or one one corporation owns all of the land in north america we we don't have you know, our free speech rights, they're based on public space. And if we don't have any public space anymore, uh, we, don't, we don't even have our free speech rights. You, you can go to home to your apartment and you can speak freely, but you can't ever go anywhere else and speak freely. So, uh, I didn't really realize that, that you can't really speak freely in a, in a non-public building. No, and that's, that's part of uh, the power of ownership 
of, of anything is you can stop people from, from speaking. You can you just evict ask them, them to leave. Just, exactly. just say go. They're trespassers, yes. Yeah. So then that whole idea of trespassers is uh, based on this, these, these fiats, these... Uh, yeah, there's some, I, I know in, uh, I spent a summer in Sweden, and I know that there, uh, there's actually the, the right to, to to camp out for one night on any piece of land, you know, it's sort of part of this idea that these natural resources are part of a, a royal domain, or, a, you know, they're part of government's domain, and that, therefore, to actually exclude anybody from them, uh, even just a meager use of them like that, would be would be wrong. I've heard in England that uh, uh, if there's kind of like a traditional passageway, like a path or walk path or something like that, nobody can close that off, that you have a right of egress or uh, easement to yeah. walk through there. And then somebody else was telling me that uh, when you buy a home in England, you're not really buying the land. You're, uh, are you, is that just kind of an uh, assumed lease or something like that that goes... Is the maybe the land all belong, belongs to the queen? I'm not so sure. Well, yeah, that, I mean, I think that is the understanding, and even even here today, it's kind of a strange thing. The the uh, Jefferson wrote about this in 1774 that he he's saying we should in in producing this this these new ideas that we should have local rule here. He argued that why are we allowing the king to 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 allocate our lands? You know that we instead should, as a sovereign people, you know, uh, form a government and have the government, our own government, let you know, lease our lands to grant, make allocations of land to to each of us. And in some strange uh, accident of our of our country's birth, Jefferson's ideas kind of got lost, and we then declared, in, two years later, we declared our independence from the King of England, from King George, and yet we still now trace the title. If, if someone buys a house in in uh, New England, you still trace the title back to George Grant, King George granting that land to someone, who then transferred it to someone else. Who then so we're still tracing it back to the King of England, even though uh, we declared our independence from that. So king. he didn't even grant it, right? We just snatched it. Well, he granted it to someone originally, and then we declared independence from him. And from then on, it was wh whoever wanted to alienate it uh, could would be free to do that. So in some ways, so in some sense, I guess you're being subgranted from the someone who long long ago died um you're being subgranted that land um from the king on through that uh, deceased person to to the, the current owner of of that land so it's a, it's a kind of a strange mishmash of uh, of both royal title and um and alien alienable ownership Alienable again means uh, right to purchase or right to sell to somebody, right? Right to turn over the, the, the full control of that to someone else. And whatever uh, you know, we can either quit our claim or we can make a warranty that we had certain claims, and we either have uh, right to mineral rights or airspace or or land or whatever water rights or it can be divided up too, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, you can always uh, elect to. Hold on to certain things and allow easements, uh, you know, through through the land. Um, so once those easements are granted, then those easements go with, in with the title. I can't uh, ungrant them, and so then those are somebody else's claim on this land. Yeah, if they, if they're without duration, yeah, then they they're perpetual. They then, then they last forever. So you know, originally, like in our conversation, we started to talk about a flow. A flow of consumption equal income, and some and somehow this is the consumption economy. Or there's is there a better word for that? It's just kind of like your gross natural product, or it's like what is that uh, the term that would be? Oh, I mean, I, I think we're, we're referring to flow of funds uh, yeah. analysis. Sometimes it's called. Uh, so uh, the flow of funds just means from households and from actually businesses, any kind of entity, right? Right. Even I cities. I mean, has a flow of funds, what comes into the city and what leaves the city, and then also what is traded back and forth inside the city. Right, exactly. When you receive income, then the flow of funds is interested in what happens to that. When you receive an income, do you save some of it? Do you, do you spend some of it? Uh, do you <clears throat> gift it to someone? Do you lend it to someone? You know, so there's different things that can happen with that income, and that's, that's what the flow of funds analysis tries to, to follow through. And what we identified was that uh, uh, because some people, mm, through ownership or through some original rights from King George or whatever, they had more money than they could spend. And then 
from that, a whole industry of banking started to arise because where was that money going to go? In other words, from very young age, we learned that not to put money in a mattress, but try to make it work. And right. I guess interest in capital is even from biblical times, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, this has certainly been uh, issues that have been have arisen for a long time. I mean, the uh, markets have existed for a long time. Uh, you, you hear about them uh, through ancient history and in the Bible. And so the, these are these are institutions that have been growing and changing for, for thousands of years, certainly. So anytime that uh, we discussed that anytime there's excess capital, and then uh, if that's not just uh, flaunted as wealth with gold and and uh, palaces and uh, you know another kind of a uh, consumption, uh, it has to be somehow reused or reinvested. We said, and so then that's what we call structural debt. It has to be made into a debt and pumped back into the economy. Uh, to stimulate some kind of new activities that don't exist now. And for a while, those activities can be uh, uh, life-supporting. And then after a while, we're just, uh, we're, all our life is supported. And then it has to be in some kind of other uh, uh, investment vehicles that uh, are more abstract. Yeah, I mean, and this is a problem that, that businesses have to to tackle is is how to get, you know, it, how to create demand, you know. So that's what advertising is a lot about in marketing. It's how to get people to buy things they wouldn't otherwise buy. Um, I mentioned earlier the sort of the, the military aspect of that. So how, how to get you know government to buy more than it would otherwise buy. You know, so that's done through lobbying and and uh, through you know all of the uh, through running congressional campaigns and things like that to get them to spend there. But then for consumers, we we use uh, marketing and advertising to get them to want these things that they might not otherwise want if they if uh, you know you didn't associate them with sex appeal or or celebrity status and things like that, and so we get people to spend more that way, or we get people to spend more. Um, you know, there's there's known strategies that like the oil industry and the automotive industry had to had to uh, tackle the uh, mass transit in the cities. People would say, you know, they would do surveys and they'd find, well, why don't you buy a car? And most often people would say, why would I buy a car when the streetcar comes every five minutes? You know, and so they they went after the streetcars. They tried to get those uh, hobble them and make them not be quite so convenient, not be quite so frequent. And uh, so that and that gets everyone to buy an automobile. And then once you get everyone to buy an automobile, then the focus was on getting them to buy two or get them. To buy right. Three. Well, once they bought an automobile, then uh, our lives spread out real far away, far from rail and far from uh, uh, cities and into our own little nook where uh, public transport wouldn't work. Exactly. So it kind of, it, it was almost a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy for the automobile. I mean, they, they, they sort of gained from their own success in uh, spreading everyone out and, and uh, not only hobbling transit deliberately, but then the, the very existence of the automobile, because it, it requires a lot more space, forces people to, to move farther away from the transit. So. The more convenient the automobile gets, the less convenient transit gets, and the more convenient we can make mass transit, the less convenient the automobile gets. So, so then this structural debt somehow grows and grows and grows, and it's got to be there because yeah. uh, it equals to excess excess wealth, right? Right. Is that it? And then somehow all this extra spending and this interest just keeps is a positive feedback loop where it keeps piling up this excess capital. I don't know if excess is the right word. It's just an abundance of capital or something like that. Yeah, I don't want to necessarily put a, a colored word on there that would say bad or good. But well, it's a concentration of wealth and concentration. it's a, and it's a concentration a of income uh, and yeah. consolidation of it. And yeah, so and then the debt itself becomes just another way uh, to transfer income from those who work to those who don't work. So that by holding a debt instrument, by holding a credit instrument for someone's debt, then you don't have to do anything. You don't have to contribute to the economy. You just simply hold that, and that then transfers again more more of the fruits of their labor from from them. They get less. They keep less of that, and it gets transferred to someone who holds that credit instrument. So they, that ends up alongside the original ones, the ownership of corporations, and the ownership of natural resources. Uh, this structural debt arises alongside those to serve the same function and further concentrate wealth and further concentrate income and further concentrate political power. So in other words, uh, that's kind of like our English heritage, that uh, we have a noble class. We, uh, this is a structure that creates a noble class. And, uh, and although we say that we don't have a nobility, 
Yeah. Uh, we have a necessity to, ha to have a nobility because we have a system that has a positive feedback loop and it keeps building wealth. And then those people, well, they don't even have any time to work. They just have to manage their money or, or right. uh, you know, they wouldn't even have time for a career, right? <laughs> well, I mean, they, they, just too bill they may actually do work. I don't mean to say that, the, that they don't work, but the point is they do have these property claims that allow them to receive incomes without working. So they may also do work alongside it. They may do charity work or they may do, uh, you know, just make themselves, keep themselves busy or they may do something productive alongside it. But the, but the fact is they own these property assets and those property assets transfer income from those who worked to them. And, and it sort of, and it creates that bad feedback loop where it just makes things worse. And the stru yeah, the structure is getting more and more like, like that, or is it? Because I mean, I've heard like in South America, there were such concentrations of wealth. And has that ever smoothed out any, or I mean, is there anywhere in the world where a concentration of we wealth kind of spread out or? Uh... Uh, it's hard, I, not that I'm aware of. I mean, it's the kind of thing that unless you deliberately, you know, end it, you deliberately reverse it, there's no sort of uh, tendencies that we have today to stop it. Even the, the ones that do stop it, you know, d your debt doesn't go with you when you die. So if somebody is in, is a, has a negative net worth and they die, it's just that that uh, doesn't help concentrate wealth into someone else's hands. That they already, it's wealth they already had when they were living. And so that, that kind of reverses it. But, you know, bankruptcy doesn't help it because if somebody files bankruptcy, they take some of their assets and they give them to people who already had lots of wealth. Um, the bailouts certainly don't help it because you take the people who were who knew how to game the system when the economy was doing well and they were winning and concentrating wealth already and then the economy collapses and you bail them out and again transfer additional wealth make sure they don't lose any of the wealth they had and even give them more and so uh, so the bailouts also work against this uh, our, our own needs as a society to, to somehow put the brakes on and reverse this concentration of wealth so one way to reverse it in a way might be just to hold interest rates really, really low because then it doesn't concentrate that much, right? I mean, then uh, the rents, the economic rents, and even now, I mean, the value of houses are, is low too, right? It's kind of like, but is that just because of a recession or, I mean, not, not, not even a recession, I want to say a deflation. I mean, what is it, what's going on right now where... Uh, it looks like that the uh, concentration of wealth has stalled out or is slowing down, and not uh, systemically, but just for the, these moments, maybe. Oh, I, th I think, uh, yeah, the, the, maybe the, the, the housing bubble, well, well, it was concentrating wealth. And again, that volatility helps concentrate wealth as well. The people who are gaming that system know that the volatility, if you can cause prices to go up and then down, whichever, whatever kind of thing you're trading, even homes and real estate, that if you can make those prices fluctuate, you can then concentrate more wealth into your hands. But yeah, those are with the with the housing bubble collapse, we do get uh, you end up getting people who are in a op, they're they're in that position to take to capitalize on that opportunity. So they may they already had wealth and now they can buy up foreclosed homes and kind of build a, a media a real estate empire for themselves. Um, I was going to say on the the issue of nobility too. This this noble class we've created. I I, I like to say that uh, we've actually supplanted noble privilege, which th they were very aware they wanted to go after noble privilege with the American Revolution. But we've replaced it accidentally accidentally with ignoble privilege. So it's the privilege that no longer has a noble obligation to anyone. Uh, the nobles had a, had noblesse oblige. They had an obligation to care for those in their domain when something went wrong. And uh, now the, those who, who hold the wealth and concentrate the wealth, they don't have any obligation except to make wild sums of money. That's their, their, their fiduciary responsibility, as we say, for a corporation, that they're just supposed to make as much as they can. And it doesn't matter how, you know, who they hurt in the process or who's injured, um, that that's their only obligation. Yeah, this is when, uh, like I was saying, the third generation company in a town, exactly. you know, and then when it was sold, they, they divorced themselves from that town. Right. And uh, they had no obligations. No obligations. Those, yeah, just to make more money and as much as right. they could make. Right. And then by the old theory, uh, the old theory that was based on, on people who had a relationship with their communities, uh, that old theory was just to, to allow them to do the best they could. And so then now we're allowing these people to do the best they can, which is just play Monopoly like uh, <laughs> exactly. never seen before, right? Right, right. It concentrates more well. Monop the Monopoly game was actually designed by an economist who was trying to address this, Henry George, 
Um, and it was meant to show that, you know, that, that that's is how the, the game gets less fun as you, as, <laughs> as uh, the wealth concentrates and it gets less, less interesting um, because it's no longer really much about initial uh, individual initiative. Once somebody is so lopsidedly winning the game, it's just, uh, it's just sort of, you just want it to end. <laughs> Nowhere naturally occurring is is the uh, the so-called nobility or ignobility uh, decreasing uh, by itself, and somehow mm, the middle classes and the and the middle wealth expanding by itself. But maybe we could uh, imagine a scenario where, if things were different, that uh, the, uh, it would stimulate a a, a more equality of, of holding wealth and somehow what would we have to do? We'd have to eliminate the feedback loop or, or lessen it somehow. The feedback loop meaning the loop of, of how wealth creates more wealth. Right, exactly. I mean, that, that's part of uh, the, my proposal uh, that I call Path to Prosperity for Us All. And it, it basically deploys a solution. It's the only one I've been able to come up with to this problem, which is to impose a progressive net worth tax and use that progressive net worth tax to end these particular property assets that are designed to distribute income from those who work to those who don't work. And so we do have a need to support those who don't work. That's what retirement pensions are about, and that's what the disability insurance is about. So there are certain people who have a need to be supported uh, when they cannot work and, and when they shouldn't have to work anymore. But that then gets subordinated to these other kinds of property assets that are distributing income from those who work to those who don't, that then take a precedence even over, over our retirees and over our, our disabled. And so by ending those property claims, by uh, taking natural resources back under the domain of government, so government will steward those natural resources and the only one to receive incomes from those natural resources will be government, we, we stop that that concentration of wealth. So when we say those that work and those that don't work, in the older socialist view, that kind of meant factory workers and, uh, and factory owners. But there are those that work in an intellectual way or somehow uh, uh, there's those that uh, develop new products and ways to market them and uh, are good at organizing uh, workflows and so on. And, and in a way, they don't. we don't mean those, right? Because, I mean, that's the older socialist view of. Uh... Yeah, well, I'm not. Try yeah, I'm not trying to assess you know, whose work is important and who's not. But, but as I say, the in the case of stocks of corporations, in the case of natural resource ownership, in the case of structural debt, these are just paper claims. These kind of fictitious property assets we've created that that don't mean that you, you know you don't work, but it means you don't have to work. That you will receive an income whether you work or not, just as a pension retiree receives an income, and just as someone who's disabled receives some income. Um, but when we see a concentration of wealth in these property assets, these paper claims, then the amount of income they receive is gigantic and the, the need for structural debt arises. And, 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 so, and that ends up getting prioritized over actual more important needs of retirees and, and the disabled. So in other words, uh, instruments that bear interest and instruments that bear uh, dividends would be... Uh, not existent, or would they just belong to the government, or would uh, well, uh, in the case belong to the whole? I won't even say the government, like that's a nebulous world right. word, but somehow belong to the whole. Maybe be in in a cooperative structure or something like that, or or how would it work ex actually? Yeah, in the case of uh, the corporation stock, um, there the, that wouldn't exist anymore. The the thing about stock is it in the case of an interest bearing instrument. The, if you think of it from the perspective of the, the enterprise, the workers who, the collective workers who work in that enterprise, they basically uh, do work really hard and, and, and use their creativity to produce. And they agree to pay someone 5% or 10% return over the course of the year. And that's, that's the agreement made in the case of a, of a loan. Um, in the case of a stock, it actually reverses that process. And, and, but, and I should say, and they keep the rest. So their hard work, they keep the residual, you know, they just pay that five or 10% and they keep the residual for themselves and they decide what to do with that. In the case of a stock, you reverse that. You, you say, we're going we're gonna to put a cap on what you earn here working here. You're going to make this certain salary fixed amount. And if you work really hard, 
that residual is going to go to the owner of the stock. And so it, it kind of turns all of that on its head and it creates this, uh, what economists call an adverse incentive for the owner of the stock to actually use up that worker, to, to you know, use them as much as they can. So then you need a managerial class, right? Because it, otherwise you would, they would say, okay, I'm just going to work up to my salary and then I'm not going to make any surplus. We'll just play basketball after that. Well, yeah, certainly the man managerial class is important and supervisors, you know, try to get people to work longer. And it's even through custom, you know, we, we work eight hour days. That's our custom here. And it doesn't matter if we could reproduce ourselves in two hours or three hours. The custom is to work eight hours. And so people expect to go get a job that, that lasts for eight hours. And sometimes they work overtime and do a, even work longer. But um, that extra work, that goes to, to the owner of the of that corporation and not to the people who work in the corporation so by ending ownership in it and turning over the corporation to be democratically directed you still have the managerial class there and the managerial class will will respond to the policies and the procedures dis established by the workers to even impose you know work rules and and uh, expectations for how hard you work on on the fellow workers but it'll be something that they do collectively they decide how hard they want to drive themselves in order to compete in this uh, market economy, um, but the the financing would happen all, entirely through these debt issues that uh, and through borrowing and uh, in that way they would uh, just pay a fixed rate to the to the lender and keep the residual for themselves. I mean, without stock, uh, and you are you talking in the scenario if there was if the stock if there was a co-op, right? The, yet you're saying there still would be borrowing and they would pay to the uh, the residual to the lender. But I thought we were saying there wouldn't be any interest either, or, well, or is that just on certain instruments? Well, my proposal is to eliminate structural debt, and it's it's to eliminate all debt, all personal debt, and all uh, governmental debt, all federal debt, uh, one time. So debt could then accumulate in the future, but it would accumulate not under the conditions where we have a need for structural debt, not in the conditions where we're, we're transferring income from those who work to those who don't work through stock ownership and through natural resource ownership. So now debts would arise and it would be a way of, of con concentrating uh, enough wealth to make a large enterprise and produce something you couldn't otherwise produce. But it wouldn't be through the necessity that structural debt uh, requires that we uh, that we require lending, whether someone needs to borrow or not. So then, uh, how would wealth be accumulated? Uh, well, it would, it would be much, much the way it would, but it wouldn't be accumulated. We we would uh, not have a goal of it being concentrated. Um, so people could still do well for themselves, and those who work in a corporation. So, so those who work in a corporation would then keep what they produce, other than what they have to pay to fi to financiers. Um, but they wouldn't have to give up the residual of their work. So all of their hard work would remain uh, their own benefit and it would encourage hard, hard work and it would reward the ingenuity and hard work in that corporation because those doing that ingenuity and those doing that hard work would retain the fruits of that labor. Um, and so the, 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 the interest bearing is not really getting the residual. They're getting their agreed to amount, the fixed amount that, that, that the corporation agrees to pay them. But the residual of that hard work stays in the corporation. So in, the, in, the, in opposition to a stock where the residual goes to the stock owner. Right. So then there wouldn't be any stock. But still, there could be uh, individual enterprises. And, and one person without any stock could, could have a, an enterprise. And he would be able to uh, run it the way he wanted to, I guess. And he would, let's just say he was good and he was uh, accumulating wealth. And then he'd probably want to do something with that wealth, right? He'd want to put it in a bank. And then... He'd want to have interest on it or want to lend it out to somebody that needed accumulated wealth. Sure, certainly. I mean, and that, this isn't trying to stop that. Again, I'm just going after that structural debt. So we certainly want people to, to save and we want people to lend and we want people to borrow. But we want them to do it under conditions where it's not a necessity to, to have borrowing, to have debt. But rather, um, the, the reason that we want to borrow is to smooth out discrepancies in our income and expenses to, bu to buy long-term durables that will last a long time. No reason not to borrow in that circumstance. But then we're not driving the economy through through debt alone, and uh, rather debt is just servicing the economy as opposed to the only thing, the only engine driving it. So it's like now there's a huge debt and we're going to step it down, right? And right. then there'll be a smaller debt, right? Because there's still excess wealth. Right. And so then it still might have a tendency to start to sneak up, right? I mean, that's yeah. okay too, right? Or Well, the key thing is by eliminating structural debt, we're eliminating the conditions where 
some people just borrow or some people just lend. That's all they'll ever do. As opposed to it, when you can eliminate structural debt, you'll find some people lend at some times and borrow at other times, or they, they save at some times and they dissave, as we say in economics, at other times. So uh, that's a natural thing. Is, you know, when you start off your working life, you're probably going to have to borrow. Um, and then later you'll do well for yourself and you'll be able to pay off that, that borrowing. But, um, and that's sort of just a, a good way to run the economy. You know, that's the way we want to have it happen. The problem is with structural debt, you have people who will lend their entire lives. They will never ever have to dissave. They'll only right. save and never dissave. And so when you have that kind of person, and the only reason that person exists is because of these other property assets that are moving income from those who work to those who don't. Right. Let me just shift gears here a little bit and, and talk about our, uh, not so much, well, maybe the Fed, but the banking system and the, and the markets, because the markets do a service. And uh, excess capital is needed. And uh, at one time we were talking about a third generation company that had a good business, but they weren't all necessarily all that liquid. Their, uh, their assets were tied up in plant and in, in uh, land and in uh, 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 their operating capital and so on. They couldn't really touch that. And so they needed accumulated wealth to, to make an expansion plan. And so then we use the markets for that, so that the markets are supposed to uh, create capital and create liquidity. Now, I don't know if I said it right when I said create capital, but somehow they make an offering, right? And they write stock and people can gather funds to, do, to make a move. And somehow that seems like it's added value, you know. And then in that whole melange of, of offering and, you know, making liquidity means where you can buy and sell a market capability, well, then people notice that because of supply and demand, if everyone tries to buy one thing, it goes up. And somehow, whether whatever the reasoning is behind it, uh, and if everyone withdraws from one thing because they say, well, you're so big, I mean, GE, how are you ever going to grow at 40%, you know? And there's no for market for you to even take, so we're going to readjust your value from 200 down to 20, uh, where it should be, maybe. And uh, so then that part of it is kind of like a hype, I think, and it kind of depends on some unknowing part of the uh, part of the investors that are not professionals to be kind of like the cushion where the other ones draw on. They 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 lure you up, and then they lure, they drop you down, right? And then why when it's getting high, you say, "I better buy that. It's going so high." And then they everyone exits the big uh, pension funds and stuff that uh, that create market. Really, they don't. They're not price takers, right? And so then. Uh, that part of the market seems like it's not adding value and it's just kind of like shifting funds around back and forth and just kind of like uh, more of a, uh, what's a good word, like uh, uh, they're just using the efforts of others or just kind of like predatory, let's call it. Right. Yeah, I, I think that's that's part of the problem. I mean, we... There are different ways we can do this. Financial intermediation is we the big word we use in economics for it is is important operation that you know one person typically doesn't have all of the funds they need in order to build like say a wind turbine farm, um, and so you need financial intermediation. And some people they, they don't want to think a lot about what to do with their money. They just want to put it in a safe place and let someone else go ahead and do that. And so that's part of that specialization that can take place too. Is someone else can be constantly evaluating projects and thinking about which ones are uh, worthy of investment and which ones are, you know, going to really take off if, if we invest in them. Uh, and that's, that's all important parts of our, of our economy. Um, but then we, we end up with uh, a lot of these markets that also allow in pred predatory interests and these speculative predators and, and things like that, that they, uh, they're able to siphon off a lot of money and they, they enjoy being able to siphon off a lot of money. And that's that rent seeking I spoke about. Um, and so even though we can think of better ways of doing financial intermediation, just as, even as just a compliment, you know, as, a, as one of many ways of financial intermediation. Um, like, for instance, I propose the uh, credit union of the United States where we no longer extend FDIC insurance to private banks, but we simply provide a single pool that you'll, you'll have your deposits insured by the full faith and credit of the United States. 
And that credit union will then uh, simply make loans to people based on their credit worthiness. Not with a, they won't evaluate projects. They'll simply loan based on your credit rating, you know, your credit history that they would keep. Um, and so that would allow uh, us to have equalized access to this national credit pool as kind of a national treasure, uh, national treasury for us. And we we would borrow all at the same rates based on our credit history. And people could then borrow and with a stellar credit history, and they could. Uh, they could then evaluate projects. They could then, in, in a decentralized manner, decide, oh, this, this project is worth, worth funding, and I'm going to go ahead and put my own uh, credit worthiness behind it and, uh, and try to get it off the ground. Um, and that would be a way to complement the existing markets that, that exist, the bond markets and, and uh, the derivative markets and things like that, that, that also perform this function. But the problem is there's such a sense of entitlement you know, for, the, for this privileged monopolist that they would clamor. They, they do that every time government talks about it, even with like the health insurance option, the, the public option that, was, that Obama proposed. This was just going to be an option. And they said, but we can't compete with that. And to me, we should understand that as being uh, this privileged monopolist saying, I deserve the privilege of running this monopoly and running this game. And I don't want government getting in my way. But I don't think we should tolerate that. We should say, look, if we think of a better way to do something, <laughs> we're going to do it. And if you can't, if you, and your job then as a private enterprise is to find a new way of interfacing with our existing uh, institutions that allow you to make money, not to enjoy a privileged monopoly to uh, do something in a worse way than we know how, you know, when we know a better way of doing it. Let me just go back at it one more time because like, I'm trying to separate what part of the markets are really to our advantage, which is to create capital and create liquidity. And in that liquidity, we trade, right? And then the price depends on like supply and demand, which means like it's very volatile. It's not really based on uh, what's the value of the assets of the corporation or what's the value of the market of the corporation or what's the value of of uh, um, the ingenuity of the corporation. It's more based, you know, some of that is in there, but it's also based on just fad. Right. And, uh, and so then uh, people that trade know that, especially when they have big blocks of capital like pension funds, and uh, I don't know who else, insurance companies maybe have big blocks of capital. And these enormous blocks of capital, which don't really are meaningless to us. If someone says billion to me, it just doesn't mean anything, yeah, right? right? We just don't realize any, any exactly what that could mean at all and how one person would have the privilege of moving that and saying, okay, here, this hunk goes over here. No, now this comes away from here. And the, the actually the effect of that, mar what it, it does to the market and what it does to those people that just say, oh, look, I don't want to think about this. I just want to have some place to invest. I have a little bit of surplus myself. I want to play the game that everyone else is playing. Of course, they're playing it on the wrong side. Yeah. You know, the house wins or right. the people that are running it. And it's, it's raw gambling, basically. It's raw gambling that's unregulated. And it's, uh, it's just a zero-sum game. And it's just ripping people off, you know, to transferring wealth. from. And so then that, I think, is somehow, is there a way to separate that those two facets of the market? You have to be able to trade because otherwise it's not liquid. The market has to kind of somehow equalize the price depending on who's going to run it, run and buy it, you know, and they create fads and create all this, this advice and stuff like this. And then as long as something's moving up, someone wants to get in, someone else wants to get in on it, you know, which makes it move up some more and they want to read it, right? Read right. it when it's getting kind of top heavy, right? And so then it's not that it's self-regulating whatsoever. It's kind of just like a game that really helps those that know how to play it. And, and, uh, and it's a silly game that is basically what used to be uh, legal only in Las Vegas. <laughs> There's something to that. I, I do think uh, that there is a, uh, that it's not just a zero sum game, that it, does, uh, that it does provide the necessary financial intermediary function that we need for our economy. So there's a service provided. But I think it is that service is getting drowned out. It's getting uh, far outweighed by this predatory interest that. Are That's involved. all I mean. That's all I mean. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. outweighed. And now. it is becomes more like a casino. And I don't know if you know, but the federal government even passed laws uh, in the last decade or so that uh, that stop the states from from regulating these financial intermediaries as casinos because they were moving more and more into very casino like operations. What would that mean, that the states could actually just tax like they tax a casino? 
Yeah, or they could even they could even you know not allow them. They could say you can't do that in our state because that we don't allow gambling in this state, or we only allow it on riverboats or something. You know, so you'd have to move. So them. the market would have to go to a riverboat, right? <laughs> exactly. now, I think that would be very wise, actually. <laughs> Maybe, and you can imagine, like, what if we didn't have financial intermediate? What if we only had casinos? And if you wanted to say, well, we'd like to open a stock market or something, and you had the casino saying no, because that's going to hurt our business. This is the only way people think they can ever get ahead in life is through gambling at the slot machines. And I think we have a similar thing going on where, where we, ha we know better ways we could do it. The liquidity is only necessary because of the particular way we're doing financial intermediation. If, if, we, in, if, we, don't, uh, if we simply create a credit pool, this is kind of like the insurance pools, uh, risk pools I was talking about before. If we simply create an insurance uh, a credit pool, we can put that credit in there and, and the federal government can hold a little bit in reserves to make sure they can, uh, that any problems that arise, they have something in reserve. Um, and we can manage our credit that way. We can still consolidate enormous amounts of resources in one place, allow people to borrow enough to invest in large projects and things like that. But we don't need to um, uh, we don't need to turn it into a commodity. What what they call in in the market securitization. You don't have to turn that credit pool into a bunch of tiny little securities that can be traded and have liquidity. That's only for somebody um, who's given up on that credit pool idea. Um, but so if we put a credit pool, you could simply have savings instruments offered by this credit union in the United States and people can buy into them a three-year CD, five-year CD, certain penalties if you withdraw early or, or not, you know, depending on the policies set. Um, and that, that allows people to, to get into the, to the financial intermediation to save money and to dissave, you know, as, they, as their needs require. Um, and you don't necessarily need the, the, the securitization and all the wild speculation and predation that takes place over in those markets. You can have that next, next to it, and you can also have casinos on riverboats. So you can have all these different options. But I think if we know a good way of doing it, let's at least put that in place too alongside the... Yeah, I like options. that a lot, you yeah. know. I mean, I was first going to say something else. Like if we started real basic, we'd say we got something here, we call it freedom means we can move around and we need some flexibility right so then we need to buy and sell and we have to have some something that equalizes or the or that you know but we don't want it to move too fast so then we call that stability we want price stability especially especially yeah. because we don't want bread to be six bucks today and 12 bucks tomorrow and 25 bucks the day after right. we want to kind of know where we're at right for over our lifetime it doesn't have to be fixed anymore and it's a lot less fixed than it was in, in the beginning but i mean when you have a car you have uh, springs on the wheels right but somehow you put shock absorbers on there so that this doesn't go totally wild and unstable right and so the shock absorber we could put on the market even if we said okay every buy is is it has to pay a fee every sell has to pay a fee and then it's going to slow it down right because right. you have to yeah. think about do i really want to buy this or not it's not like i'm going to just sell it in 10 minutes and then just say oh well i paid two fees there big right. you know am i crazy or what you know yeah, that, that's a financial transaction tax many have been proposing, and I'm, I'm in favor of that. I've been advocating that for many years. Um, and some call it the Tobin tax that goes back many decades. Keynes even proposed something along those lines. So that, it, can, it could even start real low. And yeah, We can see what the effect of it was. And right. those people that were complaining, uh, that say, no, no, that'll blow us up. That'll blow us to smithereens. We'll just see. And then say, well, that worked pretty good. Let's, let's add a little bit. Yeah, and at low levels, it doesn't hurt anybody but the predators. It's only the most predacious in the market that are going to be hurt by something because they do lots of really tight, you know, really Tiny large trades, buys huh? and sells of, of things very quickly. Um, they hold on to things very short time and, and get in and out and, and arbitrage. Yeah, well, it's not just arbitrage, but it's also the creating volatility in the market, create the panics. The way you create a panic is you, you do a quick sell of Dump something soon, yeah, right? and, and, and get everyone else to panic and then you pick it up on the bottom. And, and so, when when you put that tax on there, it makes it a little more expensive to to do that kind of predation and, and cause panics, and uh, that will help everyone else who's in there for legitimate reasons uh, do better for themselves too. So that was really interesting. You said that we could still have casinos. Yeah. You know, because I think that's the the way we are in this country. We believe in compliance. We comply to the laws, and we want things to change gradually, and we don't right. want to shock anyone, or we don't want anyone to be real upset. And so then we don't really want to just change uh, markets and close them down and tax them, but we could make a, another market compatible right. uh, alongside of it and say, well, look, here's a market that's more safe because there's no pre and we don't allow any predators in here because of our, our taxing. We don't allow big movements here. 
we don't even allow uh, pension funds to buy here. You know, they have to buy over there, right? Mm, right. And this is just uh, you're buying on the on the, based on the value of a company, and the value of its management, and the value of its employee base, and the value of its product. And uh, you know, if you believe in that product, buy. It's a long term deal, and there's you know, you're in a way you're assured growth, but you're not assured any kind of boom or bust. Right. And if you want to play the other game, you can either go straight to the riverboat or you can go to the New York Stock Exchange. Exactly. Well, I mean, it, it, that's if we still have stocks. I mean, like I said, my proposal is to actually eliminate those. We, we'd still have bond markets, though. We'd still have other derivative markets. Um, so that there would there would still be a need for these exchanges and, and private trading and securitization and things like that. But um, yeah, I think I think providing options, you know, and we like I said, when we know how to do something in a better way, let's at least put that way in place and let people people have options to do other things. And and it, too much we respond to that sense of entitlement and that sense of privilege, that the clamors that says I don't want government doing it because I'm making lots of money here. <laughs> and the reason they're making lots of money is part of that zero sum game that you refer to is yeah. that they're they're making money because somebody else is being injured by it. So. Right. So then we say government, you know, okay, let's just look at, uh, go, well, let's go to the past in you know, two, three hundred years ago. And uh, things were a lot more, less sophisticated, let's say. And then uh, there was kind of governments or there was entities that ran uh, certain departments and, and managed certain assets. And they weren't all that really honest. I mean, even uh, biblical passages always talked about uh, I don't know exactly which one, but gave the, the feeling that people profited by their positions mm -hmm. and that uh, it was their family and, and themselves that uh, were always number one, number first, and whatever was left over could go to. So it's not necessary that in, in if you look in the third world, uh, well, I don't know, I'm supposed to call it the emerging world, I think. Uh, and uh, I think uh, if you look in Africa, you look in South America, I think historically, even I lived in Italy for a long time. And historically, there was little fiefdoms. Mm -hmm. uh, the mayor, you'd have to go and kind of grease them up there if you wanted to get anything done. You want any kind of permit done. I mean, South America, I mean, uh, Asia, there's so many places. It's not that government just uh, uh, works great as no. far as uh, managing assets. No, I mean, we, we definitely need, uh, we have to have higher expectations about government too. We need to expect it to be, uh, to provide equal protection and due process. And I think, I mean, I think in a lot of places we, we have that in the United States. Um, and uh, especially at the federal level, I think we, we avoid fiefdoms mostly. Where we end up with them, I think, is particularly in the military industrial cartel. And that, again, is, has happened through a privatization of things that uh, probably belong uh, under government control. Um, and when you privatize those profits, so you create a, a war profiteers who make wild sums of money because of their sale of armaments, um, you create the conditions for that fiefdom. So like what I propose is, is what I call a zero tolerance for rent seeking. So we expect government to, all of us, if we understand what rent seeking is, that we're, we're not about trying to just shift people's uh, incomes around and wealth around, but, but try to you know, provide equal protection for everyone and due process. And once we uh, insist on that from our government, we'll, we'll get better governmental service, I think. Just to give another caution, uh, there are um, employee-owned companies, and they're not always the best-run companies. And they don't, I don't know, is that because uh, by the time they got to be employee-owned, it was just too old? Uh, all, their, uh, all their assets and their production facilities were outdated? Or I mean, I don't think they have a stellar... Uh, uh, record is track record as far as being winning companies. Uh, I I haven't seen any any data on that particular. Um, I I think uh, to me it, it's not about who owns the company. It's about who directs it. You know. So you know I'm a firm believer in democracy, and I think that uh, if we're going to create, if we're going to have government create to charter a corporation, an enterprise, that we should expect that to be democratic, just as we expect it when it charters a town or city or county. That that too will be run democratically, and so um, you know what I'm proposing is no ownership of towns, no ownership of, of an enterprise that's chartered by government, um, but rather its directorship would be through its own employees, who then work with their management. So they would still have the same managers, the same CEO would be right alongside them, advising them, 
and uh, and working on that. And today we have uh, we have a breakdown in corporate governance. So I think there's even an opportunity here that we never had before, where where the CEOs right now are already running roughshod over their boards of directors, and the boards of directors have learned to ignore their shareholders and and control their shareholders. And so it's not it's already not working the way we, we expect it to work. And so if we now just say, well, we're going to put workers in charge, they're going to be the directorship. We still have a rather independent chief executive officer probably, but we'll at least have workers who, if they elect to, to uh, exercise their new power, will be able to, uh, to direct the, not only the, tr the strategies and tactics of that corporation, but even to change the goals. They don't have to just make mad sums of cash. Uh, they don't have a fiduciary responsibility to shareholders anymore. They have a responsibility to to do what they want to do and and uh, sort of foster their own entrepreneurial uh, desires and and, uh, and 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 work with their own community because they they're going to live near that that corporation. So you can see the whole linkages because like uh, because of the market and the way it's traded and because of supply and demand and so on uh, and that that controls the share prices and uh, it, because. Uh, it makes the CEO focus on quarterly returns because if he has two or three or four qu three quarters in a row that are kind of down, then his stock price could go quite a, quite a bit down, right? And mm -hmm. then he's going to lose all his bonuses and actually get a real... So then uh, I worked in Italy for a long time and I worked in the, in the sector that was kind of like a mid to low size company, which are basically all family companies. And they don't have to answer to anyone. Yeah. And so they have a lot of long-term goals. Yeah. And their long-term goals are some dream they had, who knows, when they were a kid or something, of having a, some kind of a smoother product or something else. And they can bring that along every year and, and put as much of their surplus into that as they want to. And uh, as long as they're living okay, they don't have to answer to anyone. So then I can see that, I mean, I think we all can see that um, living on short-term goals just doesn't get anything worthwhile done. It just uh, kind of scrapes by and uh, and doesn't really leave time for any anything of value to build a future. And in fact, what kind of a future are we giving to our children and grandchildren? Yeah, I think we need, need to think a little bit more about our posterity and, and what changes we can make now to give them better lives. Uh, and I think uh, this idea of not only is the CEO sort of uh, focused on short-term goals, but they also become uh, beholden to the analysts themselves. And so the same banks that, that are too big to fail also are the ones who call the shots and can direct the CEO independently to say, look, we're going to, we're going to rate your stock down if you don't do what we want you to do. Um, and you're not working the way we want you to work. And we'd like, you know, or they say to the insurance executive, you know, we'd like you to deny, deny more claims. We'd like you to basically pilfer more from that insurance fund. You're collecting premiums and created an insurance fund and in healthcare. We're seeing 25, 30% of that is basically siphoned off for other activities. And Wall Street analysts are rewarding insurance executives for that. They're saying, we're going to rate your stock high if you make that pilfering of the insurance fund greater. Um, and so we're, we're creating undue power on Wall Street uh, over, over all these corporations where they, they can't think in terms of long term. They can't think in terms of anything other than making wild sums of money. So. That's, uh, it works both ways, too, because you were, you were referring to analysts, you were referring to the external analysts that are kind of forcing them. But they have internal analysts right. that try to, and they're the spin doctors, right? Yeah. And they're making up this story, and they're cooking the books, I say cooking it, but they're presenting the books in a way that, that somehow is most favorable for what they want to do. And it just shows, oh, we're making this great profit, and, we're, and even, even the profits that they make are, are maybe fake. And they're, they're dependent on... Uh, on things to happen in the future. And if those things don't happen, then the future uh, already has a huge loss in it before they even o uh, open the door. Yeah, that, certainly that can be a problem, you know, and they, they have certain have certain standards they're supposed to adhere to, but to, uh, you don't always see that happening. And uh, they can manipulate the stock price. They can, they can adjust when they announce, you know, when they reveal the, a problem somewhat. Uh, and uh, Isn't that the origin of all the huge crashes? that the books were not uh, uh, treated properly uh, month by month, and so then all of a sudden this big surprise was under the covers? 
It may be. I don't. I'm. I'm not totally familiar with that. I'm sure it happens. I'm sure uh, sometimes you don't want to admit that, <laughs> that uh, things are. You, you want to think there's some way out uh, that you won't ever have to reveal those problems. But again, uh, that's what the cover up is all about. Because the moment they say something like that, their stock prices plunge. Right, and it becomes so so interested in stock prices. And I think yeah. I think it's not just a, even a rumor. Yeah, yeah. Even rumors can affect it, and it's not just that, but it's even it's become such a horse race. It's you're betting on these horses, uh, these stock prices, who are being manipulated by analysts and by speculators and other predatory interests in the markets, and so much is focused on that, and not and and it draws focus away from actual entrepreneurial, what I call entrepreneurial arts. You know, what is it? What does it mean to be a corporation? What does it mean to produce? You know, produce something for for consumers. Um, I sometimes think, uh, you know, the reason Steve Jobs stood out so much among CEOs is because he was someone who really was focused on on what a consumer wants in a product and how to make it the best it can possibly be. And uh, he certainly engaged in all the other things that corporations are expected to engage in. You know, he, he, he offshored the production and, and did all of those things that if he had not done them, analysts would have come down on him hard and the stock price would have plummeted. And um, and so I think that he makes a great example of, of where we see this uh, this kind of undue manipulation of, of our corporations. Uh, I would imagine, uh, especially with the people uh, that he has surrounded himself with in Apple, that if those workers were democratically uh, running Apple, they would have given him all the leeway he needed to uh, to thrive as a great CEO, and at the same time. Uh, not have to uh, necessarily do all of the shady things that our corporations are doing, like off, off, offshoring and outsourcing and that sort of thing. It's interesting when you were saying that uh, uh, even uh, CEOs don't have time to do the entrepreneurial things because they're protecting their skirts and they're... <laughs> the rent-seeking. Uh, yeah, they're doing all this rent-seeking. So then yeah, it reminds me of a time when I worked in a government laboratory and, and uh, the science that we did was maybe two thirds of the year and, the, and uh, one third was all about mm, justifying uh, my position and getting a grant for next year. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, we see that a lot. We talked about uh, so many ways that uh, society could could somehow be more efficient at creating a space for every individual to have some outlet for a creative outlet for his energy. And we talked about ways that seem to defocus us from that and focus on other things that seem more urgent, uh, such as our markets and, and, uh, and, and making a market more important than than really what our whole idea of jobs are supposed to support is our lifestyle and, and our families and our communities. And uh, out of that come some communities that are doing really good and some that are really in tight, tough shape. Uh, some states that have low unemployment and some states that have high unemployment and some classes of people that are almost left out of the equation. Mm -hmm. And uh, and when they were just uh, disorganized and uh, alone, uh, we just thought, well, they can't make a very big noise anyhow. And it, uh, whether it was just or not, some of us could feel it wasn't un was up, that it was unjust. And somehow we just didn't feel that we had the energy or the know-how to do anything different. And we just accepted the, the line that says those people in some way are inferior. And mm -hmm. they, they deserve it because they... They weren't uh, diligent. Right, uh, right. And I mean, I don't want to you know, get into a fight over whether that's, there's any truth to that or not, but I think it's important to understand that if you create these kind of property assets that distribute income from those who work to those who don't, that even the, even the best worker, the most diligent worker and the most talented worker is going to receive, gonna enjoy less of the fruits of their own work because someone else is siphoning it off with this property asset. And if that person is not getting able to retain the fruits of their own labor, then the one who's not quite as talented as them and not quite as diligent is not is receiving even less. And it goes down the you know one tier after another until you find people who who just aren't talented enough and aren't diligent enough to find work, but in part because we've allowed the siphoning off of, of uh, incomes to people who 
don't even have to work if they don't want to. So uh, then we create a whole uh, destitute uh, level to our society. That, yeah. and so then we think about how to cure this, you know, and then uh, uh, some people say that it should be privatized, right? And it should just fit right into the other system, but it's not a profit-making event. So it yeah, can't yeah. really... Uh, it can't really be addressed by that kind of a system. And uh, it's like that fascia of society that uh, has to receive the scarcity because the scarcity is inbuilt in this system, I, th yeah. I say. I yeah. mean, uh, we didn't really agree on that. but uh, <laughs> uh, So then the solution that comes to me is that we should have a uh, parallel, some, some, you know, because, I mean, we, we say there's a lot of parts of society with education, with health, and with uh, income that are somehow left out of the equation and how to address that with our, with our society. And somehow it doesn't seem like uh, the big companies and the big markets are going to really do anything down there. It's going to be their last, last, last priority. And so then when we talked about, I, uh, I really liked it when we said that there could be parallel institutions and there could be another stock market based on social enterprise, not on profit. Mm -hmm. And it wouldn't necessarily be a nonprofit, but it would be, uh, it would be something with social objectives instead of profit objectives. Right. And maybe it would be somehow uh, have another market and we could just see if anyone would invest in that. And they would know that there's no profit there, but they want to take some of their money and they want to cure social ills. I mean... This is kind of on a model of Mohammed Yunus or, or uh, the Grameen banking system in Bangladesh right. or uh, uh, what they call micro lending. And uh, it wouldn't have to be a micro lending idea. It could just be a separate, uh, separate uh, class of business uh, called uh, social enterprise. I think he's talking about that now also. Yeah. Uh, well, I, th I think those are, those are all good uh, ideas that uh, have, have helped people get, you know, the micro lending help people who wouldn't otherwise borrow. A uh, part of that, I think also the micro lending is part of that structural debt problem too. It's, it's, it's someone came up with an innovation and the financial community seized upon it because they needed to find someone to borrow, um, this, this growing structural debt. And so we, they found people borrowing who weren't normally borrowing before. Um, and, and I do, I do think that there's something too. You know, we can we can kind of choose where we invest and things like that. But it's very hard uh, to we're we're kind of we're kind of doing things I think the wrong way, and then we're trying to address it. But we're so so when, when I think when we help people, when we we provide welfare and things like that, we're not even undoing the damage we're doing by our other assets. These assets that are transferring the fruits of labor from those who work to those who don't work. That has created this sort of underclass, or it's certainly contributed to that underclass. And our giving, our charitable giving, and even our uh, and Medicaid and all of these things that try to make up for that, they're not even quite making up for the damage we're doing. Um, I think if we fix that damage, we'll find that, that uh, things become more transparent. We can see uh, who needs help and who doesn't need help and who's doing fine. And and then when we give charitably, we will actually be helping those uh, who we aren't injuring at the same time. <laughs> and uh, so that we need, to, we need to end that too. So I, I think in some ways, micro lending too is probably just getting back to some people, you know, through lending, what has already been taken from the fruits of their labor through these other uh, forms of property and that ownership of natural resources and, and corporate ownership. I'm not so sure I've been reading about it, you know, and uh, micro lending. I think it was very difficult to, to attract capital, and there was some, uh, some capital attracted from, but even later in the later stages, some capital was attracted from uh, NGOs and, and charities, you know, but from mm -hmm. banks, it was very difficult, and they were dragging their feet completely and taking six months just to make an, uh, any kind of additional loan or getting any money in there. And then I'm not so sure if now uh, some of the Grameen projects are not self-sustaining in that uh, there's enforced savings for all the borrowers and each one has to save, uh, you know, two, six percent or something like that of their loan. And somehow that's enough to um, whether I'm, I'd have to reread that to see if. It, but I don't think that uh, it was really forced from the top, from excess capital. I don't think really forced uh, uh you know, and they totally didn't believe it could happen. Of course, it happens with no documentation and no credit rating. It's a total different system that uh, right. that's based on uh, some kind of a community where a five-woman group, and usually it's women, 
uh, would support each other and also chastise each other if uh, uh, both, you know, with the carrot and the stick. Yeah. Uh, if you didn't pay your loan or got behind in your payments, those other four wouldn't get their pay any payments anymore either. I mean, they wouldn't get any more loans. Right. And so then it's kind of like a community type. It's a very, it's kind of amazing uh, no, I th innovation. I, I, I definitely think it's a good idea. I, um, the, w the way it's structured is, is, is a valuable thing. And even that, that five women like you're talking about, that's a, another risk pool. So in other words, they, they're pooling together exactly. and, and, they, and not only pooling risk, but also, as you said, they, they, they create a cultural uh, sort of norms that, you know, they're gonna, we got to make sure we repay this loan together and we, we have each other to, to rely on to do it. And that helps make it less of a risk for the for the lender, um, but I think you know they, they, I've, I don't doubt that they were slow to jump on it. The you know the financial world financial community was slow to jump on it, but they since they are in need of finding borrowers, once it was shown to work, I think they, maybe they have they, right. And and the but some of the some of the interest rates are very high, and and I, as I said, I think we're sort of uh, indenturing them to a financial community which only gains because of what has already been taken from them. So we're kind of you know, it, it it's a way of dealing with our current institutional arrangements, but I think our current institutional arrangements need to be changed too. In a way, it's a different thing because, uh, well, when you look at Bangladesh, uh, they, it's not really been taken from them through their labor, right? I don't believe, because it was like a real base peasant class that, that never worked for anyone. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I don't know if they didn't own land too, somehow community land and so on. Uh, I'm not so sure that, but they found themselves in a place where they had absolutely zero. And yeah, well, I, even though it's a peasant uh, community, a peasant uh, economy, uh, even there, there's a, because capital is spread throughout the world, so they're still, they will employ those from the family. You know, some will, will go in and work and they, they will usually work under hyper exploitative conditions. Um, and so even though it's a benefit for the family to have one of the members going to work in the, in the local factory or, or you know, produce, um, it's still, you know, the, the fruits of their labor are being taken through these different institutional arrangements. Yeah, I don't really want to uh, make this into uh, talking about uh, micro lending and certainly don't propose that as any kind of solution around here. Uh, but I mean, I just was proposing uh, uh, another kind of a market, you know, and we yeah. already proposed one that's more stable, it doesn't have as much trading or it has much more dampening on the trading. Right. And then uh, we also pr proposed uh, limits uh, to the size of the company in there and then to the size of the purchases and, and, you know, that the big funds couldn't really mo uh, control price with their big movements. Right. And then uh, now I'm saying even farther than that, we could have another market that's only based on, on social enterprises that would uh, attack the holes in society, which are the health and the income and the education. And, uh, and that would be their own, yeah. their only places that, that they would move. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then we would just see, if maybe I would take my money out of the other market and I would put it in there and say, well, like, I, maybe I just want stable income anyhow. Right. And uh, so I just want to support uh, my uh, my income will be more stable if my community is more stable. Yeah. And, uh, and then so then that could be some kind of a solution. I, I think those are all excellent ideas. I and even think the micro lending works very well. I, I I've described this before um, in my proposal of this credit union in the United States. Since everyone equ we equalize everyone's access to this this national credit pool. You can then form these kind of uh, micro investing, you might call them, uh, groups. You could group together with your neighbors and create a, an organization that was simply going to borrow on, based on its stellar credit rating and find projects that they thought were valuable for their community and, and just valuable to the economy in general. And, uh, and basically, it, it, it eliminates these too big to fail banks because it makes banking something that can happen in someone's garage or in their basement. It, it, it's it's uh, it, all of the services of banking, the stuff that necessary monopoly services are taken over and provided through as a utility by government. And then the, the real innovative stuff, the real entrepreneurial parts of banking, you know, the ability to evaluate projects and analyze them and, and uh, kind of uh, <clears throat> consider what the future might bring, that gets decentralized and, and, and brought down to the community level. And we can even help each other. So the other role of banking, what we sometimes call consumer banking, where you're trying to get people to 
to invest in these projects, you know, that are evaluated elsewhere, um, that becomes something that we can help each other with, just like we do with the internet, you know, like people help each other with their computers and get their internet connection running. Well, you can turn to your family member who knows a little bit about investing and they can help you find those investments. And, and so we can really create a community kind of banking uh, that you don't even get from, say, a credit union or, or, you know, the local community bank, but actually, you know, even without commerce, you know, in a sense, you're not, you're not buying these services, you're actually just helping each other out. Right, like a forum or something like that, a yeah. forum post, but that could be, that could be kind of uh, difficult because there's so many hypes already, you know, and then... <laughs> right, but, but we could help each other avoid the hypes. <laughs> right, and find the hypes, right? Uh, well, we do that already, like with Craigslist and stuff. Yeah, yeah, those are some great, uh, great new institutions too. Um, and eBay too. I mean, of course, great uh, decentralized marketing, merchanting operation. A lot of times we say, "Well, you, uh, that sounds great, and we can visualize a perfect uh, world that would be more perfect, right?" And then we say, "But you can't get there from here." So how you transition into that? So then you suggested, like, let's have a government credit. Uh, a credit uh, union, union yeah. right? So then let's just all take our money out of Citibank and Bank of America and we'll put it in this credit union. And then will we have to bail out Citibank and Bank of America again or what will happen to them? Because if they have a, a massive outflows. Yeah, well, that's the key thing. I mean, FDIC itself is, is really, I believe it's another one of these extensions of undue privilege by government to, to privileged monopolists or oligopolists, you know, multiple ones. Um, and it, it's not such a it's not such a heinous one. We've got some much worse ones, but it is. But that's what it is. And when it really becomes heinous is when it gets to the, those five too big to fail banks, because the whole point is we're going to extend you this insurance, but if you fail, you're going you're not going to be running this bank anymore. We're going to put it combine you with someone else. But the problem is when you have the, the solution is always to combine them with someone else. So there is always this consolidation. Then it gets bigger and gets it bigger, gets and, big, gets and bigger. they get down to those five biggest, and then they refuse to even combine those five. You know, you could have combined them into three, and then you could combine them into two, and then once you combine them into one, you could have said, "Look, that's our credit union in the United States. We're done combining, and now we're going to keep make sure we have the proper reserves." Uh, because that, that's the thing. Whenever you extend insurance, insurance companies are all aware of this. The financial services sector is all aware of these issues I'm raising, and they don't care. You know, so they they're basically pilfering the public treasury knowingly, and with knowledge. So in insurance, there's this problem of adverse incentive. When you extend insurance to someone, and we're going to insure your car for damage, there's an incentive you have now adverse to the fund, to the insurance fund, to crash your car or to be less careful, less careful right? about keeping your car from crashing. And the same thing happens. So when you extend insurance to FDIC insurance to the deposits of private banks, you create an incentive for the bank to be more careless with the deposits, to more, go ahead and make investments. More risky investments. Right. You can take on more, more risky investments and not worry because you've got that insurance backing you up. Um, and the only, the only thing you know, fighting that adverse incentive is the idea that I might lose control of this bank and I may have trouble finding another job running a bank if, afterwards. So that's, that's what's tried to ameliorate the adverse incentive. But, um, but it does, that adverse incentive exists. And if you simply create a credit union in the United States and we say, look, deposit your funds in Bank of America if you want Bank of America to insure those deposits. Deposit your funds in the credit union in the United States if you want the full faith and credit of the United States insuring the deposit. And now there's no adverse incentive because the, the, the bureaucrats who will run this, this credit union, they don't benefit from, from uh, risky investments. They simply try to figure out with their actuarials, you know, how much can we afford to, how much do we need to keep on reserve and how much do we want to loan out? And that credit pool simply becomes available for all of us to use and equal access to it and, and to make investments in ourselves and our, in our entrepreneurial ideas. Um, and there's no adverse incentive. There isn't, there won't be an incentive for them to cut the reserve so small that, that uh, they can't make their commitments to their, to their depositors. Um, and so just removing that adverse incentive and remo removing that undue privilege um, ends the monopolistic tendencies. You know, we don't, we don't even need regulation because there isn't a tendency to create too big to fail banks that you need to then fight through antitrust operations and things like that. You just, you, you, you make public government run those components, those tiny components of banking that that are necessarily monopolistic, and then everything else will be competitive and will be dispersed and community level and and all that. So. 
We talked about so many things. Yeah. We uh, really got a, a real broad understanding, uh, I believe. And uh, some things, of course, we don't, you know, we haven't worked 20 years in uh, economics, <laughs> so we don't understand all the things you do. And uh, I think well, a couple more things we should make clear. And, uh, and, so, uh, and I'm a little foggy on it anyhow. And one is the national debt. And one is the way the Fed creates money and just by loaning it and and you know what part the structural debt probably plays in both of these right right good but topic, yeah. somehow we think that it's also because we need things that we can't finance and it could be armaments and it could be social goods and it could be uh pensions right. and uh but we we're confused of uh how much of that is necessary because we you know, we think, I think we're thinking like in terms of our personal finance, like if we need things that we can't afford and we have to borrow from it, and we think, and we think that's bad anyhow, right? or like that's too risky. And then, uh, I mean, what, is there a basic difference between uh, uh, money created by the Fed and does that always get paid back or is that, or is that and money uh, borrowed by the, the government on the national debt? What is that? Yeah, th those are those are topics that are often confused, and I like to try to make sure that people understand the, sep the separateness, the, the independence of those things. Uh, when the Fed creates money, um, it's not really borrowing, and when the government borrows, it's not creating money. So that when when you're borrowing, you're not creating such an inflationary tendency. Borrowing funds from someone else who needs to lend them simply just moves the income from from those who don't want to spend it to those who do. And so that's that, that flow of funds doesn't create any inflationary tendencies. So that's kind of like the structural debt, yeah, the borrowing, yeah. the national debt, right? And the federal government serves that role uh, since, you know, from the 1930s when economists advocated that we can take on that structural debt and, and uh, make sure the economy keeps running at, at full tilt. Um, so that... That's so before that, I guess that the economy really went through a lot of cycles all the time, really deep deep uh, troughs and, yeah. and peaks. And the stock market wasn't quite so important, and uh, natural resources uh, we didn't fossil fuels weren't taking off the way they they were. You know, th th that's all kind of a 1900s, 20th century uh, when those became important. So the 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 transfers of income from those who work to those who don't work really started taking off right right at, at the turn of that century. And uh, the structural debt started becoming a problem, and so government taking on debt was seen as the solution to that problem. And and it is it's a, it's a necessary solution. It's it's something we cannot balance the budget without dumping that structural debt problem on on households. You know, so like in the seventies, that when the Vietnam War ended, it became clear to the financial services sector they needed to find new people to borrow this structural debt because government wasn't going to be borrowing it for the war in Vietnam. So they looked into creating land speculation and turned you know twelve or fifteen year mortgages into thirty year mortgages and pe got people to take on much larger debt commitments. Um, funding was cut to student to education, higher education especially, and we got students to borrow to pay for their education rather than funding it through through taxes. And uh, and then credit cards arose out of that too. So we got people to take on uh, you know credit card debts, which were very a great convenience, but they also uh, helped uh, find people. You know, in our society, who would who would be irresponsible? <laughs> which yeah, we I think that's really uh, worthwhile just to uh, to repeat because uh, you're saying that uh, all these different ways they found the structural debt found it uh, new outlets to find borrowers. Exactly. And we were always thinking that uh, 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 the homeowners and the thirty year mortgage was something that the government stimulated so that we could all have homes. But uh, uh, well, yes and no. Right. Yes. That, that was certainly. Th but, the, you know, we could all ho we could all ho own homes without having structural debt. Um, I mean, part of my my program, my Path to Prosperity for Us All does help people uh, take ownership of their own home and we eliminate the structural debt at the same time. And so then we're, we're going to take on debt after that, but only for the reasons that we should take on debt. You know, if you, you might improve your home and take on some debt. And, but it, it, and, you know, for some people, for the responsible borrowers out there, that's all, already how they live. But the irresponsible borrowers, <laughs> we need them. They're, they're an integral part of our, our ecosystem <laughs> that if we didn't have them, our economy would be in collapse. 
And so, like I said, we owe a debt of gratitude to them, even though they are irresponsible. Yeah. And so by eliminating structural debt, then we don't need them so much. And we can try to help them not be irresponsible as opposed to asking them to be irresponsible. I mean, that's what banks do when they're going after uh, subprime borrowers. They're eagerly trying to find irresponsible borrowers because especially the responsible borrowers have backed off. They've already felt uncomfortable with how much debt they took on. Um, and they start to back off, and then the banks have to turn to the most irresponsible borrowers to get them to take on the structural debt. That's so important to just keep saying that. I mean, we've said it a few times, but it's so uh, counterintuitive. Yeah, it is. And, uh, yeah. It's like counter like what our old belief structures is, uh, believing that those uh, irresponsible people are really bad, and yeah. to find out that they're actually fulfilling something that is totally necessary uh, or otherwise our economy would have collapsed and we would have been a long time ago in, in high, high unemployment and, and you know, stagnation and who knows, stagflation and uh, right. all and, kinds of... And I think, so take, making this a public utility, like with the credit union in the United States, we can actually then, I mean, some people talk about creating, you know, better literacy and financial literacy. And that's all fine and good if you don't have structural debt. We, fi, li, that, Financial literacy gets in the way of finding outlets to structural debt, so there's a in, there's a disincentive to create. So I say more about financial literacy. Well, financial literacy, the idea that you know, understanding when you're res borrowing responsibly and when you're borrowing irresponsibly, you know, like that's that's an important thing to know. If you don't have structural debt, if you have structural debt, then we have to actually hide that from people because we need the irresponsible borrowers, and we, we don't want them to know that they're being irresponsible. We don't want to want to draw attention to that. Um, because if they don't borrow, our economy tanks. So, it, so I think if we get rid of the structural debt and we put this in a credit union in the United States, again, removing those adverse incentives, now the credit union in the United States can actually put in systems. You can create software, open source software, people freely download that help them understand their own financial picture at any given time and, and put up flags when, they, when they're, maybe they're borrowing too much you know, and reminding them, you know, maybe they'll think it's pestering, but... But just putting those signals out there is something that will help benefit our whole economy and, and keep them, too, from, from falling into debt that they shouldn't fall into. Um, I, I noticed uh, I was traveling through Canada once, and I was staying in a hotel, and a commercial came on um, because they have their national health insurance program, um, their Medicare for All. This, this commercial came on the television that was reminding you about workplace safety. Like, don't hurt yourself at work because it hurts us, you know. So that's where when you've aligned incentives properly, your insurance, your monopoly insurance provider that's government run will actually tell you, don't hurt yourself because we don't want to have to pay out on this. When you have it instead through a private privileged monopolists, they're happy to have you hurt yourself because they'll just raise the premiums, you know. And now they bought the hospitals, so they own the hospitals too. And they, they used to try to stop paying the hospitals if they're, you know, they, that's where the whole PPO, HMO, all these new innovations came out to try to keep them ha from having to pay out to the hospitals. So at one point they said, why are we going through all these machinations? Let's just buy the hospitals. Then we'll pay whatever they're asking for because it's us asking for the money and then we'll raise the premiums. And so that's how we ended up with premiums that are sometimes twice as high as per capita as any other country in the Western world um, because the incentives are now misaligned. And it, it's no problem if you injure yourself or if you get sick. It's not a problem for the insurance company because that, that just means they increase the pool, they increase the premiums, and they increase the the 30% automatically increases that they siphon off the top for themselves. So, so then uh, we're when we're talking about the the national debt and uh, trading debt around and, and taking on the structural debt with the nation uh, when not enough individuals are willing to do it, even the irresponsible uh, sector. And then uh, there's the other part about creating uh, more funds because what is it? We need more liquidity to fill uh, to to make the slush work back and forth. Somehow it's uh, drying out. Or uh, yeah, I mean, you raised the question about creating money. So creating money does in cause uh, inflationary tendencies. Um, so uh, the more money that circulates given a certain amount of commodities that are circulating, the more money will mean the price of those commodities has to go up or or perhaps uh, like sometimes there's a liquidity preference. People want to just hold on to money. And so that money can go up and, and the velocity of the money, the turnover will go down and then prices don't have to rise. But there can be this tendency. And so there's a danger when you're increasing money. Uh, there's a danger if you don't increase it enough that you can cause prices to fall. And when they fall, people panic. We don't want that to happen either. But uh, 
there's a danger in letting too much money into the system, which allows, which will facilitate, which will accommodate inflation. And when that happens, that, that can cause all kinds of problems too. It messes up people's savings. It messes up the savings of the retirement system, the Social Security Trust Fund. If we have unexpected inflation, suddenly that two and a half trillion that they're saving for the baby boomers will be insufficient because, you know, because inflation will rise. So we don't, we want to have stable prices, relatively stable prices, or even uh, slightly rising prices are okay too. That creates a, an incentive to invest in other things. You know, if, if the value of money is slowly falling, it's called demirage, um, that will encourage people to find new other ways of investing, not just, not just hold on to money. And that, that lets money work better because it, it keeps money circulating and that's a good thing for the economy. Um, but the, the Federal Reserve creates money in a very different way than the banks create money. So there's fractional reserve lending creates money and the Federal Reserve creates money just simply out of thin air and what they call base money. And uh, those are very two different operations. The, the, uh, I think the Federal Reserve likes to kind of put the focus on the fractional reserve lending. The fractional reserve lending is always created through debt. You, um, you take in deposits into a checking account not into a savings instrument, but just into a checking account, which means I expect to be able to draw on that. You know, it's not, I'm just, I'm not telling you I'm saving this money. I'm just saying, this is how I use my money. I just use my debit card and or write checks. And that's, that's how my money works. You know, I, I don't need money in my wallet anymore. Um, and so that's not, I'm not trying to tell the bank I'm saving that money. I'm just putting it there to use. And, but if, but since fractional reserve lending allows them to go ahead and lend out 90% of that, uh, they can actually basically create money out of thin air and they, they take the money I've deposited, they lend it about 90% of it and that creates new money and that money circulates just like the money that I had put in there. So that's a very different way. The Federal Reserve, on the other hand, they create money out of thin air. They just simply say there, instead of there being, you know, uh, $1 trillion for circulation, uh, there'll be $2 trillion for circulation. You know, they can just, with a few types of, on a key, keypad, uh, change that amount. And when they do it, how they then have to introduce that money into the economy. And I don't think the uh, Federal Reserve Act actually specifies how that's done. So they're free to do it in many different ways. And the way they do it is to buy secondary, uh, they buy treasury bonds and treasury bills on the secondary market. And so they are engaging in debt, but it's debt that already exists and would exist anyway if they used a different method to introduce that money into the economy. Do they just retire those bonds or do they, uh, or do they later sell them at a later date? Sell um, them back? Well, they, so they buy those on, on the market and they end up holding a lot of treasuries. And when they retire, they then turn to the, the primary market, they go right to the treasury and they replace them. So it's only when the initial introduction of money that they... But to keep that money that they've introduced in circulation, they they buy a replacement bond from the treasury. Uh, right. I say they buy it when it matures. They don't really take the money. They just uh, they buy. Yeah, they just, they use it to buy another one. Right. Just to keep to it. To swap going, it right. for another one. Just yeah. to keep it. And so they they end up accumulating uh, more and more of our debt, which is in some sense not really our debt. So I think they have over a trillion dollars of our fifteen trillion dollar debt is held by the Federal Reserve, and in some ways it's an internal. Thing. I mean, they are probably. In a way, it's meaningless because they just made the money up and, and bought it, right? They, right. And right. nobody really came in. China didn't come in and retire any of its dollars or anything like that. Right. They earn interest off of the bonds they hold, just like anybody else does. But the, And they use that interest to uh, fund their operations and they return the rest of it to the, to the federal treasury. So they try to stay, uh, at least the, give the appearance of above board in. Um, in just running their operations. Of course, they decide the size of their operations, you know, and so I, I would imagine they, they spend whatever they feel they want to spend um, to to run the Federal Reserve. But does anyone check if they got private jets and stuff like that? Or uh, I don't know. I've never looked into that. I'm sure they all have their private jets anyway, so I don't know if the Federal Reserve is buying them, but, but, yeah. but they might uh, facilitate that too. I don't know. But uh, so that the uh, that that debt grows and and it's kind of an internal internal operation. So anyhow, like uh, I put my money in the bank in my checking account, the bank loans ninety percent of it, and then I withdraw sixty percent of it. What does the bank have to go to the Fed to Fed and and borrow that other thirty percent? Or 
Well, they, they they can. That's kind of a last resort. They also have lots of treasury There's bonds lot of, they hold, and they can sell those on the secondary market. There's a slush fund all around there. Right, and they trade between each other, so it kind of creates a pool among the banks uh, to trade. Uh, you know, like so. When you, when you actually, so when they loan that money out to somebody, they may have an account in a different bank. So all it does is simply um, change the, you know, from your bank to their bank. And so they can then, you know, kind of make a swap. You know, they do a clearinghouse. They'll just uh, pay out uh, his money to me when I make my withdrawal. So exactly. Then it's all yeah. in there. So it, it's it, an amazing system that, uh, so in a way, it's so complex, you know, but it's computers, anything can happen. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I'm sure computers have helped vastly with the operations, and and they've made it they've made it even more of a monopoly tendency. You can imagine when, uh, I mean, a lot of where our electronic money came from was the invention of the telegraph. So before that, we had to use currency. We currency basically serves as a as instruments. A, you had to reuse written instruments before. Right. right. So it, it basically serves as an interpersonal uh, bookkeeping system where right. where you take it from your wallet and put it in someone else's wallet, and basically you've then you know debited one wallet and credited the other. So that that just happens through paper or through coin. You know, you could do the same thing with a silver coin and, and just move it from one pocket to the other, and that's that's an accounting system. So when the telegraph inv was invented, they then could create checking accounts because now you could have a, a, an accountant, a bookkeeper at your bank, who's keeping all the, you know, keeping all your income statement and your your your, your general ledger and all of that, and they can telegraph to the other bank. All right, we have a we have a clearing. Uh, we owe you this amount, and you owe this us this amount, and they can check both. That they're both right, and and then they can just affect a transaction, a transfer over that telegraph. So that's where we had the rise of electronic money, which means that you just don't need that silver coin in your pocket anymore. You can just keep track of it through through a general ledger, and uh, and so with the with further computerization, it becomes even less and less necessary to have a separate bookkeeper at each bank, and rather you can just have a single system that's constantly keeping track of those flows of. Of money around the system and the purchase of other portfolio assets, and were banks better off in the old days because uh, they had to wait till the check arrived in the mail, right? So there was a five-day float or something, and now there's it could be a five-minute float, except that they probably uh, enforce a one-day or a two-day bookkeeping. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they, they probably benefited somewhat from that float, but uh, they still have they have such uh, undue monopoly privilege that I think they don't they don't notice losing that. Yeah, they don't notice it. It's so it's so massive nowadays. Yeah, yeah, even five seconds is a lot of interest, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, Rob, I tell you, we really um, we, we are uh, endless with questions here, and you've got an equally a number of uh, answers. <laughs> yeah, thanks. You had great questions too. Yeah. I don't know. It's just so fascinating. Um, the system of agreements that we've uh, we call our society, and we live in these agreements, and somehow they favor some and maybe don't favor some others quite as much. But they're hopefully the whole system without the money system. And I mean, that's what a bank too big to fail means that we need a money system where we're at right now, and uh, and that's more important than. Uh, Who's left out or who's who's put in twice? I guess. <laughs> I guess maybe. I mean, I think, I think it's those particular monopoly components, and it's the, it's the deposit insurance that's a monopoly component. It's the electronic transaction system that's another monopoly component, and uh, and it's our monetary system itself, and just simply uh, the, who gets to decide when money's created and who benefits from that, the, being the first one to use that money. That that's a benefit in itself, um, and some of that is shared by the Federal Reserve's partners, and some of it shared by the public treasury. My view is that it should all be the public treasuries. Um, so if we can separate those monopoly components, we can allow a much more competitive banking system to thrive and not be granting undue privilege to some and at the expense of others. I guess they, uh, they must have always thought that undue privilege would be granted. And then they figured if it has to change, swing back and forth every four years, it's better just to keep it somewhere else where it's just kind of, we can count on where it's going, right? Maybe. maybe. But if it was politicized, uh, the, the supply of money, we'd be kind of... Well, but I, I think that it's important to politicize it. It's important to make it a political thing because uh, the, the real genius, I think, in, in, uh, in our founders was in saying, look, if we can make sure that things only benefit the public treasury, we remove the incentives of people to game the system and, and try to do things that just benefit themselves. Because whenever we originate money, if it's just going to the public treasury, then the only reason to do it is because to help the public treasury. You know, 
Um, and there's other ways of helping it, you know, and you could create too much money. Why, why help the public treasury by creating so much money? You're hurting the public in some other way. Like there, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. But if I can, if I can originate money myself and benefit from that, then I, I have an incentive to go ahead and originate it in ways that will hurt other people because I get to spend it. <laughs> you know, that's a nice right, perk. right. <laughs> No, I, I uh, totally agree. You know, that's where I think that's uh, it's the wisest to go is to say that uh, not so concentrate on say corporate greed, but just say that the institution, the rules, uh, mm-hmm. are set up that people can easily game the system, right. and then that's where the where the injustice is, and yeah. they're just good at it. That's all, and, and we call it greed, but they're just good monopoly players. That's all. It's true. And, and uh, if we would make a system that they couldn't game, yeah. or they had no incentive to game it, right. And they, they become so accustomed to the privilege that they don't even think of it anymore. It's just it's something they feel entitled to. Uh, they don't understand why everyone else isn't taking advantage of it. Of course, if you know, it's not made that way. It's only made for some to take advantage of. And um, the other the, the solution is to instead make it a system where we're all benefiting at once from these necessarily monopoly parts of our economy. Thank you very much, Rob Burns. Sure. Thank you, Richard. So, so many, so many questions, so many answers, and uh, I can come up with a lot. Of, if you've stuck with us this long, I think we went for a long way. I, would, I, uh, I think it was all jam-packed full of something interesting and something, you know, valuable understanding and a way to, to move on whatever the opportunities are in these, these, these coming years and especially these election years, if we can talk to to our friends and uh, talk to our associates and our communities and say, well, what are the real opportunities? And instead of hope, let's try to go to understanding because if we have understanding, we don't need hope. And uh, so then somehow things can be transparent. There's the internet, there's, you know, if you have the will to sort through it and uh, People are getting together. People are, Rob and I met on, on the street actually uh, at the Occupy. And uh, I think the Occupy is a great opportunity also where people can come out and just talk to each other and notice, hey, that guy's a person, you know, <laughs> and I and no better or no worse than I am. And uh, then why not try to close these, you know, I don't even want to say loopholes, you know, because that sounds like taxes or sounds like somebody uh, sneaky made them up. But I mean, there's just places where uh, some people are forgotten, and uh, why do we need it? And is that really what our goal is? And uh, so, anyhow, thanks for being with us. Thanks for listening, and, and thanks to Rob Burns. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Richard.